Hello from London. Welcome to another episode of Eclectic Spacewalk Conversations. I'm your host, Nicholas McKay, and today we're joined by a very special guest, Vinay Gupta, CEO of Materium. Welcome to Conversations, Vinay. Good to be here. Yeah. So where were you initially born, Vinay? Uh, so I, I'm British. Yes. Uh, my father is Indian. Uh, came across in about 67 um, to work on an experiment involving rats and hormones. Okay. Uh, and spent about four or five years on that and then became a GP uh, and moved to Yorkshire. So the first part of my life I grew up in Yorkshire. Yeah. second part of my life I grew up in Scotland. Uh -huh. uh, and then about the early 90s I moved to London and kind of become rootless global nomad from there. Yeah, yeah from there, yeah. And so uh, what, what was that like, um, you know, being uh, born to immigrant parents, Scottish and Indian, that must have been a very diverse household, mm. very diverse community. Well, so growing up in Scotland in the ninety uh, in the eighties, mm -hmm. right, late seventies, early eighties, um, there was literally no racism, mm -hmm. right? They hadn't invented it as a concept. Mm -hmm. So I, I lived in a neighbourhood where you know it was probably ninety five percent Scottish white folks. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an African family. There was a Thai family, maybe Vietnamese. Um, you know, a handful of Pakistanis or Bangladeshis. And that was it. No racism. Nobody ever experienced it, nobody ever saw mm -hmm. it. Um, the Scots just hadn't had enough exposure to other cultures to realise you were meant to have a problem with them. Oh. So it was regarded as being like kind of personal aberration, like having like red hair. Sure. Like, oh, you know, like you're Indian, yes, that's weird. And then they just move on. Yeah, yeah. this is different. <laughs> yeah, but and, and there was no cultural context yeah. for it, right? Because, you know, it wasn't like people had formed teams. Mm -hmm. And there was no sense of excluding the other because you hadn't seen enough of the other to realize that it mattered. Mm -hmm. So it was this very weird bubble of, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to describe the total absence of racism that was there. Absolutely. Uh, and when I eventually began to encounter even the slightest kind of whiff of it, I'm pretty much like a white guy, and it's not, you know, it's, you know, racism is not something I see very often. But when I did begin to occasionally come across it, there was that sense of like, oh, that's what people were talking about. My <laughs> God, this is awful. Um, so yeah, it was, quite, it was quite lucky. I think that there were very few windows in history where you could be that far from the local environment and not wind up with a grind. Mm, I see. Um, but for whatever cultural reason, you know, that part of Scotland and that part of time, it was absolutely free of racism. That was amazing. That's awesome. And then, so what did you, uh, you mentioned you, you became a digital no or a nomad of sorts, and mm. we'll get into that, but what did you want to be when you grew up? Like, what were your initial things? Um, so, I very early locked on to, you know, what you generally call STEM now, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and by early, I mean, when I was five or six, uh, I would get up at 6 a.m. and watch three hours of the Open University lectures, uh, on, you know, whatever it would have been in those days, BBC Two, then go to primary school. Um, so, I, you know, I'd go from watching people, I, I remember this distinctly, like watching somebody explaining the kind of rubber sheet universe model of, you know, here is space time and it's a four dimensional oh, yes, yes, surface yes. and, you know, objects move in straight line but space is curved and all the rest of this. And like, yeah, yeah, okay, I get it. Yeah, I see what you're saying there. Yep, fine. <laughs> and then going to primary school. And it's like, not that. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I was not a popular kid in primary school, especially with the teachers. Um, so, you know, I knew that I was going to do something in that arena. And then before I went to university, there was basically this choice, which was physics or computer science. Ah. Uh, and that is a hard choice if you're interested in fundamental things. Right, right. right. Um, and what decided me on computer science was thinking, okay, so physics, we've got basically... 700 years mm -hmm. of the smartest people in the world hacking away on this. Right. So what's left is the very hardest problems. Oh yes, the decimal points of it, yes. Right, yep. the super difficult stuff. Whereas computer science at this point is basically 50 years old. Mm -hmm. We've only had seven or eight people that are legendary at that point. Uh, unlike physics where you've got like three or four hundred people ah, that I are see. legendary. Yes, of course. Yes. Um, so there are much easier big problems to be had. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I went to computer science. And that has been probably the best single decision of my life mm -hmm. um, because physics is brutally stuck. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just stuck. You know, endless amounts of energy wasted on string theory, 
the particle accelerators have produced tons and tons and tons of data, but nothing that's, that's not, helped yeah. us. We got the Higgs boson, and then that's about it. <laughs> no, <laughs> right? And I mean, it's not that that's a small thing. No, of course not. But, but it also hasn't fixed anything. <laughs> right, right, right. Right, like you don't see physicists just kind of walking around like, "Hey, we fixed everything." <laughs> um, where the biologists are just like, you know, we can tell you what happened to the humans fifty-eight thousand years ago on this tiny little island because we sampled a whole bunch of their descendants. Right. And, and there is no reasonable doubt that, you know, this happened, these people migrated here and all the rest of this stuff. You know, the biologists have just, they've never had it so good, apart from the fact that everything's going extinct. But other than that, right. you know, like the field is in great shape. Computer science is not in great shape, but it's in bad shape. And computer engineering is in amazing shape. Right, 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 right. Um, so that was, yeah, that was an important decision that I got right. And it is definitely, like I kind of just ran away from the hard problem. Um, but that turned out to be the right move. Yeah, no, um, I, I, I would say so. <laughs> and then obviously we'll get into more of what that uh, transpired to. So who were your biggest influences um, maybe growing up and how that changed into like when you kind of decided, hey, I want to do computer science to then maybe how they've changed now? Mm -hmm. So um, my father was a research scientist. Uh, as I said, in the early part of his career, then went on to general practice. And um, the stuff that he kind of put me on when I was a teenager, uh, Thomas Kuhn and Karl Popper. Ah, uh, okay. Um, so, you know, I probably had Popperian falsifiability, you know, solidly locked in right. by like 13 or 14. Right. Like, okay, right, Th that's how truth works. Mm -hmm. uh, and then about probably 21, uh, I read the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali. Okay. And the thing that people don't generally understand about yoga is that yoga came from a rationalist culture, mm -hmm. right? It's very strongly associated with kind of, you know, arm-waving Indian mysticism kind I of stuff yes, yes, here. Yes, of course. But the actual yoga tradition, you know, included essentially scientific atheist branches that ran for millennia. Right? I mean, you know, there, there, was, there was no sense in which the mysticism was baked into the methodology. Mm -hmm. um, so large parts of the yoga tradition are roughly equivalent to Western analytical philosophy. Mm -hmm. right? It's just all bundled up as a continuous... You know, think, of, think of like the Greek philosophers. Yep. Right? So the Greeks have you know, their, your Hercules and the Hydra and all these different stories. And they've got this philosophical thing going on at the same time where they're asking like, okay, what is matter made of? And you know, what is logic and what is justice? So, because there's been so much fracturing of Western society, the old mythological structures kind of got left behind, mm. and the analytical models kind of marched forward. Sure. Right? Whereas in India, because there was much less cultural dislocation, the old myth, uh, sort of mythic stuff march forward with the analytical stuff. Right, right. So it's all in a big bundle now. Well, I mean, but now, I think now more than ever, myth in general, like with Joseph Campbell being, mm. you know, kind of put up in Western culture more, that the mythos or ethos, those kind of ancient things are, I guess maybe people are more interested in it again now. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, but you also mentioned in a lot of things, uh, Bucky. Uh, Buckminster Fuller, yes. for, for people um, that are not familiar, and, and the concept of ephemeralization, which is doing more with less. So maybe, um, can you talk just a little bit about his influence, I guess? We don't have to get too far into it, but I mean, he's one of my biggest influences. Mm. So, I mean, Buckminster Fuller really begins to kick in probably 95. Um, uh, a friend of mine in Chicago has like the entire Bucky Library. Okay. Uh, and has figured out how to do a software engineering practice based on a whole bunch of Bucky's thinking. So it's like, oh, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, so I kind of absorb a whole bunch of it there uh, and then um, begin to move on in... It's hard, hard to express this exactly. So I've always tended to make things. Mm -hmm. So you kind of absorb the Bucky story mm -hmm. and then the question is, well, what do you do with it? Ah. Right. And then maybe we can transfer it into the hexahedra and stuff because mm -hmm. that, I'm assuming, plays into some of this. Well, so th this is this is kind of where the game really gets started, right? You know, prior prior to the stuff I'm about to describe, I'm still very much a kid and I'm just wandering around trying to find my feet. Sure. And then in '96, uh, things really begin to lock on, right? Late '95, '96. That's really when some life gets started. So the kind of two form of events there are. Uh, I go down and I visit a place called The Farm in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. 
and um, the farm was the the apex of 60s civilization. Mm. Uh, a guy called Stephen Gaskin takes something like 200 school buses of hippies out of the hay in 71 because they're pretty convinced that the whole hay ash culture has become toxic and it's crashing. So they haul everybody out and they drive across country trying to find a nice patch of land to settle down on. Um, and the, th the thing that people forget about the Back to the Land movement is they were expecting a nuclear war. Mm, right? That's right, yeah, and all that was still very much around. There was a whole survivalist yes. aspect to the hippie trip that totally. people totally forget. So, you know, they were really going out to start a new civilization somewhere out of a city because they didn't want to get flashed if things went bad. Right. Um, so there was, a, there was a sort of hardcore, pragmatic field engineering aspect to all of that. Mm -hmm. So they go and they sell, and in the course of a few years, they move from you know, school buses to buildings. Some of them are conventionally built houses, some of them are domes. Right. Uh, and they'd been living in these things for 20 years by the time that I got there. So, and, and that's, yeah, the farm is a whole other story. Um, they went horrifically bankrupt in the mid 80s. Oh, and, oh it was. <laughs> I'll have to research that then. Oh, it was <laughs> rough. Uh, and when they went bankrupt, a whole bunch of their people left for California. Uh -huh. Many of them got jobs at a place called the Whole Earth Electronic Link, okay. which is, uh, then becomes generally known as the Well, which is the place where most of the early cyber culture stuff gets established. Ah, okay. right? That was the first Very real cool. big culturally significant bulletin board system because it was where the San Francisco elite you know, kind of hung out and talked right, to right, each right. other. So that was where early internet culture really got you know, stabilized and then went mainstream. Mm -hmm. And a whole bunch of that was farm people. So, in any case, I go down to the farm and they completely changed the course of my life in a weekend. Right. So they introduced me to two concepts. Firstly, a guy called Albert Bates, who's still kicking around to run something called World, World Watch, says, this is the environment, right? This is the environmental crisis. We are screwed. And this is in 95, maybe 96. Prophetic. <laughs> well, he, he just had the data, yeah. right? He's like, look, you know, here's our deforestation rate, here's our carbon emission rate, here's the amount of toxic crap we're putting into the ecosystem. And if you put all these things together, then... Here's our trajectory, yeah. right? Yeah. Unless we get massive change, you know, with cultural and engineering practice, mm -hmm. this is the inevitable future. And, you know, he's thinking numerically, mm -hmm. right? And I'm like, oh, I understand numbers. Oh. <sighs> uh, and then the other thing is they say, hey, Vinny, can you figure out how to make a geodesic dome with no waste? Ah, so then that's... And this starts the whole thing. So, I, you know, once that question's locked in, it's obviously a good idea, right? Um, so I start making my way methodically through all the Buckminster Fuller math, trying to figure out exactly how all of that stuff works, mm -hmm. right? Not just how do I build it, but why is it the way that it is? And I spend literally six months on this, r basically redoing Fuller's work. You know, like, okay, this is where he wound up, this is where he started, how do you get from one to the other? Right, just right. kind of in betweening it so that I actually understand what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the end of that whole process, I can't do any better than four. I get like a three or four percent improvement, but it's totally marginal. It's just not, right. really, not really worth having done. And at that point, I'm stuck. I don't know how to do the next part. Okay, fine, and I go back to software. Uh, and then I've been belong doing software for the next four or five years, and then you know, right around 9-11, that's when the next phase begins. Uh, I quit software and I go into energy policy and then I spend right. basically 12 years doing energy policy and defense. Right. And then so you also then in 2012, you edited a dense tome called The Future We Deserve, mm. which is a collection of 100 essays from different people uh, across all walks of life. And I'll just do a quote here. Um, Utopia or ob oblivion, plenty or famine, freedom or slavery. We do not know, but we do know that there is a vital thread of insight which emerges when, pe emerges when people think about what they really want, what matters most to them, and how we are all going to live in just a few years. So can you speak more about maybe how that changed since 2012? Mm. So The Future We Deserve was a project that came out of peak Twitter. Okay. Right? Twitter had this kind of enormously productive spike right around then where pretty much the entire early adopter community was on Twitter and basically nobody else. Right, right? I, I mean, I remember those days, even right? at the very, very beginning. Yes. And it was amazing, yeah. right? Um, you know, once, my, once I got my friends onto Twitter, I, literally there was a summer, maybe a year even, where I saw twice as much as of the people that I liked than I had the previous year because people would habitually tweet what they were doing. Uh, and if it was interesting, you'd just go tag along. Right, right, right. <laughs> 
and that was an amazing period. And then people discovered that you could tweet hyperlinks. Oh yes, and then the sharing right? of information. And, and, and it went that. from yes. being Twitter yes. was about the physical world to being Twitter was now about the, the kind of uh, intellectual world. And at that point, people stopped putting the physical world stuff on Twitter or you couldn't find it. And Twitter became a completely different thing. If Twitter had not enabled the pasting of hyperlinks and it had retained this purely physical aspect, mm -hmm. I think it would have been a completely different thing. Right. I, th I think it would have actually changed the world in some much more interesting ways. Somebody ought to do that. Well, I mean, but so then let's keep it on Twitter because you're you have a very active Twitter presence mm -hmm. <laughs> as of mm -hmm. now. So, like, what what are your most what do you use it most for? I mean, other than hyperlinks, because you do have these kind of not soliloquies, but oh, mm -hmm. some type of monologues or stream of consciousnesses that you kind of put out. So, Twitter has recently broken itself, right? This switch to uh, prioritize tw uh, rather than timeline view. Oh yes, you know where it does yes. this algorithmic sort. So Twitter's actual utility to me has dropped through the floor in, since they made that change. Like to the point where I'm like, oh crap, I need a new medium. <laughs> if anybody at Twitter is listening, fix it, go back to timeline. Um, so Twitter for that period, before they broke it with the timeline change, was where all of the smart people that I could find were. Right. right? And if I ran across smart people that weren't on Twitter, like priority number one, get them on Twitter, that's where the community is. So th that kind of soft edge network of a thousand, three thousand, five thousand people, um, that was essentially my university, right? right? That right. was the place where you know the other professors were, and the students were, and the culture was, and the game was, mm -hmm. and things would go through that like a metabolic structure. Ah. You know, somebody would drag in something new and amazing, and they'd tweet about it, and then a whole bunch of other people would read it, and then they'd do some more research, and then somebody would do some analysis, and there'd be a couple of blog posts. And it was a kind of, I mean, I, I really have astonishingly strong distaste for the term collective intelligence. Ah, I see. Okay. But what it was was a culture, right? Mm -hmm. And it was That's a culture a that thought for all of it. Right, right, right. Um, and that was, that was, Twitter was where that was happening. Um, but again, as you began to see more and more and more people pile into it and more and more and more of the kind of celebrity culture stuff, um, Twitter begins to round off as a tool for that community because they're being diluted out. Mm. Um, and that happens, I mean, I've known that would happen to Twitter inevitably for years, because by the time you get to my age, you've seen that happen to three or four different mediums, uh, right? The diluting out process is a thing that happens over and over and over again. Um, and you get either diluting out or neglect, and Twitter is basically dying of dilution. Right, and then so, but do you think that that also has to do something with, um, one of my other uh, big, big, I guess, influences other, um, is the late Aaron Schwartz, and one of his, you know, the founder of Reddit, and his, one of his things was that, you know, before the internet, or, or before, you know, a lot of these new kind of things with Twitter, Reddit, is that um, no, not everyone had a voice, hmm. but now everyone has a voice, but now the question is who gets heard? And then that is kind of the interesting kind of thing, which you were speaking of, like expertise versus culture versus a community. So maybe just talk about more the, the overall trends of the internet, may, maybe, because Twitter is one aspect of that. And if you've seen many different iterations, I mean, you've been in it from, from almost the beginning. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was, it's funny how that works, right? So in terms of people online, you know, I got an account in, I don't know, 91 or something mm. like that. And at the time, you know, we sort of looked at ourselves as being like third generation internet people. Oh, okay, okay, okay. It's yes, quite yes. funny. And now we look like first generation internet right. people. Because <laughs> all the early generations have just gotten smooshed up into, you know, the old days. Absolutely. Like you used it before the web. Yeah, I did use it before the web. <laughs> um, but, you know, before the web, there was like five generations of technology before the web. Oh, totally. You know, it's, it's, quite, it's quite weird how it all compresses. So the main thing is that you know, global culture is just sliding into the toilet in the worst possible way right now. Um, and the internet is being dragged right along with it, right. right? I mean, you know, the line between the internet and the real world was very, very strong in the 90s. Oh, it, it, absolutely. Right. Like, we, that was when I, we were growing up. We were talking last night about how mm. we're probably the last generation to then have well, I mean, not the last, but like what you were just talking about before the web. Like, I remember when yeah. we got a modem, you know, and a DSL. Yeah. I remember yeah. that. Like, yeah. I remember all of that. And then now we start looking at kids that are just are on TikTok, Snapchat, everything. Like, that's all they've learned at such a hyper pace. They're plugged in from the beginning. Right, exactly. From the get-go. Yeah. yeah. 
And I mean, that, that separation really comes with mobile, right? Oh, so, of course. You know, yes. when the internet was in your office or in your house, when you were outside, you were offline. There was no internet. You weren't connected. Very true. Two worlds. Yep. Right? Once mobile came along, you know, the, the tendency of the internet to just fuse into everything as a default state very, very, very strong. It's like electricity now, mm -hmm. right? If you're in a place without data, the place is broken. Mm, yeah, because you're uh, not learning anything, no information is being progressed. Can't find your friends, can't do any work, right. you're offline. Like if you're, if you're in some cellar bar and you don't have mobile signal in there, you know, it's like, whoa, broken, yeah. anxiety, <laughs> what's happening? You know, they should put a repeater in here, right? So it wasn't like that, right? Okay. The internet was a direct extension of academic privilege. Pretty much everybody that had an internet account was on a university system or a big government or corporate system where they were getting their internet access directly provided by a hierarchy. Mm. So if they did something you didn't like, you complained to the hierarchy and the hierarchy put the hammer on them. Mm -hmm. right? And that was how the internet ran prior to September 93. Mm -hmm. Like it was September 90, when AOL built the gateway between the AOL system and the main internet system, mm -hmm. and the entire AOL subscriber brace piled into the internet, mm. that was the point where we lost accountability, because if you wrote to the AOL admins about the behavior of their users, they didn't do anything, because they were being paid by the users, rather than the users being provided with internet as a side effect of a job or an academic role. Interesting. And that distinction where we lost the accountability network around the user, was where the barbarians really got in. Right, right. Right? Because you went from a position where people had to maintain reasonably civilized standards of behavior or their administrators yelled at them and threatened to take away their internet to the point where people could do anything they damn well liked and there was no recourse. Mm. So it went from being a highly structured, highly policed, highly civil space with a very, very strong enforcement culture to being literally an anarchy and then a violent anarchy. Right. Right. And then well, now, this, like to do something on Twitter now, you're just yelling into the ether unless you get enough people to get on to, to the bandwagon of then making someone do something. So we went from a, a structured, hierarchical, federated system, right? So the, the internet's kind of legal system pre AOL mm -hmm. was essentially like the America's Old West with sheriffs. Okay. Right? You know, oh, I'm, I'm the sheriff of, you know, upen.edu and none of my users are sending junk mail to your user and I'm going to make sure of that, right? <laughs> and it was quite kind of square-jawed system administrators upholding the internet way right, right. because their jobs depended on it. Right. right. They had skin in that game. They had skin in the game. So yeah. you had a hierarchical but federated system. And, you know, if you were kind of a troublemaker, you could get an account in a place where the system administrators were a little more forgiving and lax. And, you know, but there was always a leash, right? And we look at that as the golden age of the internet without anybody understanding that it was incredibly heavily censored. Right, okay. Right? It, yeah, you have to have that other side of the, uh, of the coin. You know, there were a lot of things you just couldn't do on the internet because the system administrators couldn't let that happen because it would, you know, if it didn't get dealt with, it would affect their departments. Right. And if the departments didn't deal with it, it would affect the university. Like, you know, we don't really want to have to cut University of Wisconsin off the internet, but if your users keep doing this, we're going to do it. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of stick that people could wave, so they never had to. Right. Right? But, you know, the, the entire mythology of, like, early internet anarchy, it's, it's mythology. Right. It seemed that way because nobody was paying attention, but it also seemed that way because the people that were doing the enforcing were hippie weirdos. Right, right. right? The system administrators were, generally speaking, not authoritarian, but the system that they were in was authoritarian. For sure, and that's a very d different uh, thing. So then finishing up this, like in a Vice profile, um, they profiled you, the man whose job it is to constantly imagine the total collapse of humanity in order to save it. Mm. So I don't know how much you take of that, but then in the same piece, uh, in, your, in one of the quotes you had, your mission, it's, it's all I do. I get up in the morning, I figure out what, I, what to hit, and then I hit it. Mm. So how has that kind of your personal philosophy or mission changed over the years? Well, so all this comes out of 2001, right? Mm -hmm. 2001, the world changes. Of course. And we go from having a 10 years world peace to being back in the middle of a war which has run pretty much uninterrupted since the first contact between Islam and Christianity. Right, right, right. And at that point, we're back in, you know, more than a thousand years of war, right? You know, we had a, we had a brief kind of... Uh, 
period where the Christians had kind of won, right? After World War I, Islam is seriously broken. Mm -hmm. And Christian civilization kind of rocks back on its heels and sits down in the armchair and so, hey, know, smokes we're, a cigar we're, and everything's good. <laughs> uh, and then we've got the whole kind of socialism versus capitalism uh -huh, struggle. Of course, of course. And then, you know, you know, Christian capitalism kind of comes out on top of that. Mm -hmm. And then we get 10 years of world peace because we essentially have American hegemony because Christian capitalism has held up and everything else has collapsed. Yeah. Right? And, you know, both of those systems have problems, but at least having a single soul superpower that was, generally speaking, attempting to be benign, maybe falling short, but attempting. Attempting. Right? <laughs> Life was pretty good. Uh -huh. And then after 9-11, and then the cultural changes that come with 9-11, there's this thing of like, oh, we're sliding off a cliff. Right. And, you know, it was really clear. I remember really as early as Bush versus Gore, you know, when the Supreme Court comes in. Oh, yes, yes. And decides Florida. that Bush is president. Yep. Right, Florida, and then no one, and everyone just like poo poos that or forgets about it or whatever. My man, not me. Yeah, right. right. I mean, I know it because of research and, and stuff. But man, that's an interesting story. Oh, my, my entire subculture, right? right? All my friends looked at that hap what happened and were like, "Oh my god, we are screwed." Right. Right. You know, you could just writing on the wall. <laughs> yeah, well, because you know, at that point, it was two completely different visions of the future that were being held out. Right. right. And once you take the fork in the road, everything else that happens becomes you know, affected by that fork, yeah. path dependency. So we'd taken the volatile path, we were on the dangerous track, and then you get a gigantic global crisis, mm -hmm. which is 9-11. Mm -hmm. But the gigantic global crisis then gets handled by people that are fundamentally militaristic. Mm. And mm -hmm. at that point, it's like lighting a forest fire. Yeah. You know, 9-11 was the spark, but the tinder it was already there, s laid out, ready and to go. It just burns and burns and burns and burns yep. and burns. Yep. But because of where I was located culturally, I could see the tinder, mm. right? I could see the enormous heaps of dry brush, and I watched the fire start. I'm like, oh, we are screwed. Um, and then my guru was basically like, look, you know, so far you've been on this track of heading towards being a you know, kind of professional teacher of meditation when you grow up. Mm -hmm. I think that's a total waste of time. You should go and do something about the state of the world. Right. Well, then there you go. <laughs> That's right. uh, and that was really where the load began to shift. So I wind up at Rocky Mountain Institute, you know, do a bunch of energy policy stuff there. Then I invent the Hexiart. Right. Then from the Hexiart, I go to taking a look at how you'd use it in U.S. domestic, mm -hmm. which turns into the question about evacuating entire cities, which turns into the nuclear work. Ah, and it. once I get my tooth into the nuclear work, you know, what I realize is that I have an unnatural talent for worst case scenario, mm. right? Like, you know, I mean, I, I worked on stuff that had also been worked on by classified planners. Right. And the, because none of my work was ever classified, right? I was, I was I strictly unclass. Um, but there were areas that I'd worked on which classified planners had also worked on. And it was, you know, consistently that the work that I'd done was vastly superior to work that had been run on classified planners. And I heard that from people in the UK and the US. Because the classified planners are just regular folks that wind up being asked to do worst case scenario planning. Right. And if you don't have a head of titanium, you can't do it. Your mind shuts down because you can't model a scenario in which two thirds of the people that you know die. Right, and that's like such an out of, out of, con or out, out of your mind scenario. Right. right. You just can't think of that. Even though in the 20th century that happened to a billion people. Mm. You know, all the people that were standing around when things like the Holocaust happened, all the totally. people that were standing around when the 1918 flu happened, you know, you go back a generation or five before that and you get all the people whose countries were wiped out by colonialism and plague. Oh yeah. I mean, India, it, I just read a BBC thing of like 40, 45 um, trillion dollars basically is yeah. like the valuation of what yeah, yeah. Britain kind of stole from India in, yeah. in terms of assets yeah. and things. I mean, in 1000 AD, India was 40% of global GDP. Oof, wow. Right? China was another 30%, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you, if you zoom back far enough, what's actually happened in, you know, kind of our, our heavily documented history the last thousand years is almost entirely the looting of wealth from India and China mm -hmm. by Europe, mm -hmm. right? If you, if you zoom back far enough, that's more or less the entire story of the last thousand years. Right, right, okay. Well, 
we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll have more with Vinay Gupta. Welcome back to Eclectic Spacewalk Conversations. Again, I'm with Vinay Gupta, CEO of Materium. Uh, so let's first talk about what is blockchain and what is the technology around it for the uninitiated? Um, so I, I've tried to explain blockchain in different ways over many, many, many years at this we point. We have time. <laughs> uh, and I finally come to the conclusion the best way to explain it is to talk about physics. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, specifically the speed of light. Fantastic. Um, so it takes a signal about a seventh of a second to get around the world at the speed of light. Yes. Okay. And a seventh of a second doesn't sound like very long, um, but it's long enough that if you're using some kind of naive software for doing like video conference, people will continually talk over the end of each other's sentences and it makes speech really, really stressful. Right. Uh, and the reason you don't experience that when you're on a video call is because all the video, modern video calling clients stretch out the other person's video very, very carefully ah, okay. so that you don't start talking until they've finished. Right. And it's a whole bunch of under the hood software trickery to try and conceal that seventh of a second delay. Wow. Um, but if you, I mean, I used video conferencing systems before that stuff really worked very well and it was constant chopping off the sentences because a seventh of a second in conversational time is much longer than you think. Mm -hmm. you know, you know, it's, it's, yeah, quite, a while. Yeah, it's yeah. quite a while, right? Yeah. It's, it's long enough that it will mess things up. Right. Um, on the other hand, a seventh of a second to a modern computer transaction processing system, um, like a, a high frequency trading system, will do 10 million transactions a second. Right. So now a seventh of a second is more than a million transaction desynchronization. Yeah. Um, and at that point, you have a real problem, right? right, right. You, there's no way that we can synchronize the world's computers in a single agreed state of reality because the light speed delay makes it physically impossible to do that synchronization. Wow. So if you've got a trading system in New York mm -hmm. and I've got a trading system in Beijing right. and we connect these two trading systems, mm -hmm. the local trades, they could do t 100,000 local trades in the time that it takes us to synchronize our two computers to agree who owns what. Yep. So we can't have the same things being traded on New York exchange and a Beijing exchange and just synchronize them because the nature of the light speed delay gives huge advantage to the traders that are closer to the local hub. Absolutely. Um, so how do we build a kind of integrated global system for solving problems or doing work in a position where we can't synchronize the computers? And th that problem, we've, we've got lots of approximate solutions to it that have different trade-offs. One of the approximate solutions that has a, a particular set of trade-offs is blockchain. Mm -hmm. So what blockchain does is says, right, we agree this speed of light delay thing is insoluble. We're not going to attempt to do any kind of trickery around it. We're not going to fudge it or do predictive trading or whatever we're going to do. We're not going to do any of that. What we're going to do is we're going to hold the transactions back and we're going to run them in 15 second batches. Ah, uh, yes. Right, for Bitcoin, it. yep. right? for yep. Bitcoin, it's 10 minutes. Right. Right, for in Ethereum, yep. 10 minutes in a block for Bitcoin, 15 seconds in a block for Ethereum. But it's long enough that all the speed of light weirdness gets dealt with because everything talks to everything in that 15 seconds. And then at the end of it, you take the previous 15 seconds of activity, you wrap it all up in a single unit, and you publish it. Right. That's what happened 15 seconds ago. Stamp. Then you do the next bunch of weirdness, and all the transactions happen, and everything talks to everything. Then you synchronize it all in that 15 seconds, and you say, boom, stamp. That's what happened in the previous 15 seconds. And these are the blocks in the blockchain. Yep. And everybody sort of thinks that this is a choice, right? That the blockchain is one of a bunch of different things you can do that will solve that problem, da 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 da, da. It's not a choice, right? The speed of light says the machines will not be synchronized. So if they're going to be interconnected, you're going to have to quantize time. Right. Time will have to be divided into lumps because we can't do it continuously because there is no continuously. Right. Um, and this was, this was the standard explanation of blockchain, like 2011, 12, 13, 14, Right, everybody would talk about the PAC theorem and all the rest of that. Yeah. PAC theorem is just computer science's way of talking about the synchronization problems caused by the speed of light. So when we stopped talking about the PAC theorem, the whole speed of light explanation for why blockchain is necessary kind of dropped out of public discourse. And what we were left with was a whole bunch of basically muppetry as people tried to describe why we were doing things that way yeah. without actually talking about why we were doing things right, that way. Right, right. 
we're doing things that way because engineering and science leave, leave us without a choice, right. right? You either put all of the computers in the same place and you run them super fast because they're all on a you know, kind of two and a half you know, microsecond long cable. Sure. Or you pack everything, you know, uh, you, you unpack everything, you spread it around the world, but you accept that there's going to be a 15 second mandatory minimum delay. Right. The blockchain. The blockchain. And then why is that uh, different? So for instance, like in needing in general, because for me, the best way that I got into it was that I saw, like after I read the white paper and I got into Bitcoin a little early, uh, mm -hmm. not early as everyone else, but I bought one Bitcoin for a, a present to myself on Christmas for $200. So I was yeah. like, okay, you know, a little, little, in. yeah, not bad. But my biggest thing was like the crypto anarchism against like the Fed and, and all these other things. But the biggest thing was when I, when I really clued in, it was trust embedded into the system that we all are agreeing on X, whatever that X valuable is. Yeah. So why is that kind of hugely needed, especially like not just for the, the speed of light, but even just in terms of um, people buying in, hmm. you know, like transparency, accountability, and trust. Yeah, so, I mean, the place where you really see this is if you're buying or selling anything on the internet. Right. Um, all the trading systems that we have basically push almost all the risk of buying things online onto the sellers, mm. right? You buy something on Amazon, you don't like it, they give you another one, right? right. You buy something on eBay, you don't like it, they give you another one. Even with that very strong push from the sellers, uh, sorry, from the ven from the, the trading houses mm -hmm. to provide you with insurance, it's still possible to get scammed on Amazon. It's still oh. possible to get scammed on eBay. For sure. Even with a system that tries to allocate all the risks to the sellers. Yeah. Right? And that problem is much more profound than it looks because it's breaking our ability to work with second-hand markets. Mm -hmm. And if we can't work efficiently with second-hand markets, when you no longer want something, it's going to one of three places, right? It goes to a charity shop, Right, it goes to another buyer, or it goes into the trash. Right, 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 right. Right, and given the enormous overconsumption that we're doing, the fact that we've got completely broken secondary markets because neither Amazon nor eBay provides the clean system you need to do the sales, huge issues. Huge right? issues. International trade, right? You want to buy something from Brazil or Belize or Bolivia, bad enough if you're trying to do it from America or Europe. Right, that's that's hard. It's difficult. There are imports. There are tariffs. There are duties. There are and payments. The, right, they, all these hoops to jump through. Yeah. But if you're trying to trade from Brazil to Belize, right, you've got terrible, terrible bureaucracy on both sides, mm -hmm. and this is also breaking south-south trade. Right, south-south trade is way harder than north-south trade because in north-south trade you've got an efficient global system on one end. And then you've got the kind of local bureaucracy on the other. When you've got local bureaucracy on both ends, practically impossible. If you, should, if you are a, an account holder of you know, a standard bank account in a second tier country, wiring money backwards and forwards from America is practical-ish. Yeah. Wiring money from other second tier countries, incredibly difficult and expensive. Right. Right? So you know, second hand markets are broken, south-south trade is broken, right? Um, individuals, right, small business, where you've just got a single person that wants to run some kind of enterprise. Mm. International banking fees are enormous. Oh, absolutely. The bureaucracy around KYC is enormous. Mm. It's practically impossible to get through all the bureaucratic hoops to do international business unless you're quite large. Mm. It's really difficult, right? So, you know, you can't get efficiency in a global system without working second-hand markets, without working south-south trade, and without the ability for individuals to trade globally. Right, right. All of those are problems caused by a legacy financial architecture, which was never designed to solve those problems. Right. The legacy financial architecture, now, here we're gonna go, this is gonna be a little rough, right? Okay. What was the legacy financial architecture designed to do? Um, just a, a, a mass capital? I mean, I'm assuming. Uh huh. But it's so worse. It's worse than that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's so much worse than that. <laughs> More right? cynical. Then give it to me. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> cynical. Right? And <laughs> right. Well, I mean, the legacy financial architecture was built during the golden age of colonialism. Oh, of of course, of course. Right. And so exploitation, etc. It's made for right invading a country, setting up a banking infrastructure, and then stealing everything which isn't nailed down. 
right? And yeah. that's what the banking system was made to do. The banking system was there as the rail which ran right beside the gunboat diplomacy and right beside the Banana Republic. Right. Do you, totally. do you remember the term Banana Republic? Of course, comes from, yeah. Right? I mean, now it's getting thrown around way more in the United States than, than right. when I was growing up. <laughs> but, you know, literally countries where, you know, Dole or one of the other fruit companies would team up with the CIA and they would turn some place into a plantation, yeah. right? Flip over the local government, install somebody that was friendly to the fruit company, depress wages and kill the tariff structure, and, and just you know, loot these places. Yeah, I've read a book called from John Perkins, uh, Confessions of a New Economic Hitman, and that was literally not just dole. I mean, they, they got better and more efficient in their processes that like, basically they would go down to a country and just, depending on what they had, it would be either, you know, hey, we're gonna build all these malls and these markets and all these Americanized things or the Western things. And then basically, if, uh, once they knew that they were gonna default on their loans, they're like, no problem, no problem. We don't need the capital, actually, but we're going to take your resources, and then we're going to install a military base here, just so just so we're clear. And then that's what happened, you know, and in, in around the world. Yep. Um, so then let's let's talk about the trade-offs then of blockchain, because I know you mm. mentioned like I don't want to get too much in that blockchain is the entire you know um, magic pill that is going to fix everything. But what are some of the trade-offs of blockchain? Well, so let's talk about it in terms of purpose. Right? Yes. Okay. Perfect. The our good friend the internet. Mm -hmm. was basically designed for robust point-to-point -point communication. Yes. Right? Originally, it was designed for keeping computers working during a nuclear war. Ambitious. Um, but, you know, it became big because of email. Mm. Right? You could send a message from one person to, with an email address to another person with an email address across the world for free, anytime you liked, and it worked. Right. It was pretty reliable. So think of that paradigmatically, point-to-point -point communication between the individuals, which is free and reliable, versus the legacy banking infrastructure, which was intended to basically pump resources from poor countries to rich countries at gunpoint. Right, right. Right? Yeah. Two different structures will work in two different ways. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and this is a super controversial thing to say, but we are largely over colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, there are a couple of billion people that are still being squeezed super hard by yeah. it. But by the time you've got a country as large and powerful as China, you know, standing up and just being like, you know, you guys used to kind of squash us into a corner and we're sort of done with that now. Yeah, <laughs> and we're now we're gonna start put boxing right. out. You know? <laughs> like and you know, you guys kind of look like a bunch of ignorant children compared to us. <laughs> like we did one child family at the same time that you invented the SUV which one of us should run the world in future, right? right? And then now with the whole social credit system, things right. like that, yeah. You know, they're modernizing, yeah. right? But, I mean, they're modernizing in a mode where, and I, I cannot make this too clear, you know, the Chinese power structure is 4,000 years of continuous administration. Right, 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 right. right. They haven't Going had a serious ancient. glitch in their ability to fill in forms and push government processes in four millennia, mm -hmm. right? You know, what was happening in Europe four millennia ago, right? I mean, we're talking about barbarian tribes fighting over goats, right. right? And frankly, Europe was still barbarian tribes fighting over goats until like 1750 in Scotland, right. right? You know, we are not a civilization compared to the Chinese. We are, you know, if you, if you want to zoom back and think of world history, you know, the barbarians that sacked Rome. Yes, the Gauls. Right? Or the right, Gauls, yeah, right? Yeah. That's us compared to the Chinese. Mm. Right, four thousand years of continuous civilization. You get a military breakthrough in Europe and America, and the white folks become really good at war. Right. They turn up, they sack India, they sack China. Right, the old cultures take a couple of centuries to recover from this, and gradually they get back on their feet. Like, okay, we're not doing that again. Right, right? but that is the relationship between the old cultures and Europe and America. Right. right, the European, European, and American business model is directly descended from the Vikings. Mm. Right, you know, get on boats, kill people, and take their stuff. Yeah, and just set up shop. <laughs> right, that's the Viking business model. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, exactly yeah. what the Vikings did. Right? right, the Vikings would come to trade, and if there was nothing that you were willing to sell them at a price they liked, then they would move into raid mode. Right, right, and, and just take over. And yeah. just take over. And yeah. this was that. That was how the Vikings operated. Right, Vikings ran places as far away as the south of Spain, because if you had a port, the Vikings would arrive on a boat armed, come in, install themselves as the government, and then operate a trade network with the other Vikings. Right. 
And that structure rolls directly on to capitalism. Mm, that's so interesting. Uninterrupted. Right, right. right. And you know, who, who are the people that basically run that structure? Right? It's the British. The British were invaded by the Vikings in 1066. Yeah. Right. The the royal the conquest, right? The or Norman the conquest. Norman right? conquest. Yeah. So I remember that date. Right? <laughs> so the <laughs> Normans are Vikings. Right. 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 So the Viking, the Vikings capture the British crown, run Britain, Britain as a Viking vassal state, where the Vikings are the upper classes and the Saxons are the lower classes, right? And that structure is directly exported onto the rest of the world, and we call it colonialism. Yeah, totally. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed, armed guys get off a boat and steal your stuff. Right. And you have to zoom back a long way and gloss over all of the detail to get that. You know, you, it's a very blurry model of history, but it's an accurate blurry model of history. Right. right. So we're now in a position where none of the classic colonial powers have enough firepower to make that stick anymore. Mm. Right? We're out of the colonial phase of history because the West is not strong enough to be colonial anymore. Lost in Afghanistan, lost in Iraq, you know, pretty much all continues the military... Continues to lose, actually. Continues to lose, right? <laughs> like all 19 of, years in. <laughs> all of the military adventurism turns out to be disastrous mm -hmm. because the, the power gradient is no longer what it once was. Right. And once you begin to accept that the power gradient... You know, an M16 is not that different from an AK-47, right? Right. An American kid f from you know Iowa or Wisconsin is not that much different from some kid from you know Iraq bordering Kurdistan. Absolutely. And yeah. it turns out when you put them in a city and you have them fight with each other, the kill ratio is nothing like what it was in like 1870 when it was Indians. Right. right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the colonial business model was basically out of fight, right? But the legacy financial system is so hide bound by regulation. Right? It's so baked into established norms and things like accounting practices and reporting practices and all the rest of that stuff that the legacy financial system is basically unable to adapt to the end of colonialism. Right. Right? All of that massive financial infrastructure which is designed to put capital into poor countries to run an extractive economy, none of that stuff is required anymore. Right. Right? The balance of power has shifted. You're beginning to see a global economy which is vastly less unfair than it was, which is not the same thing as saying that it's fair, right. but it used to be so much worse than this. Right. Right? If you think you know the triangular trade where it was like sugar, rum, and slaves or yes, something? Yes, sugar, yes, cotton, yes. and slaves. Yes, yes. Right? Sugar, cotton, and slaves. Because they would go from uh, basically England up here to the United States and then to Africa, right? It was yeah. that kind of triangle. So it was, yeah, I can't, I can't remember exactly what was run in which direction. Yeah, right. It was across right. the Atlantic. The slaves were going to America, the cotton was going to England, and I guess the sugar was going to sure. Africa? <laughs> I don't know if that <laughs> worked out. Such a, oh my God, I feel so ignorant of history. This is embarrassing. And anyway. it was coming across the Atlantic, though. Right? That's what that was happening. So. You know, much as our modern trading systems are incredibly unfair, wow, they're so much less bad than that was. Right. And that historical trend towards less and less and less of a power differential is because science and technology have become globalized. Right. The knowledge is there. The knowledge turns into the knowledge of how to make decent weapons. The knowledge of how to make decent weapons stands you up into the ability where you're harder to push around. And then you begin to negotiate a better price for your goods. Right, right. Right? It's just not that hard, right? right? You know, if you've got a massive diffusion of technology, you will wind up with a situation where it's harder to trade at this kind of disadvantage. Yeah, totally. So then you say, well, what kind of financial infrastructure do you need for that? And the financial infrastructure you need in a globalized world which is becoming less unfair mm -hmm. looks a lot more like the internet than it looks like legacy finance. Absolutely. Right? Peer-to-peer, -peer, free, efficient. Mm -hmm. Worked for email. How do we email money? Exactly, yeah. Right? Well, the equivalent of emailing money is things like Bitcoin and Ether. Yeah. Right? Now, this is where you hit the problem, right? The people that figure this out are American libertarians. And libertarianism, you know, if you want to see a nerd drowned in a pub puddle, give them on round. Oh, of course, yeah, Alice Shrug, that's huge. Yeah, 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 I get it, I get it, yeah. And nerds regularly drowned in this puddle, right? right. Because they're not very good at politics. Nerds as a class don't really understand power because right the way through you know, their childhood years in high school, they didn't have any. Didn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, when somebody comes along and gives them this kind of like cartoon model of power, oh, this cartoon model of power makes perfect sense to me. Well, no. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I don't know whether Anne Rand 
was anywhere on the autism spectrum, but I think it's fairly plausible that she was. So what you kind of have is a model of political power and how it works, which makes sense to autistic people. Mm. And it turns out to be completely wrong, right. right? It's a theory that makes sense if you are far from the facts, mm. right? So you take that political naivety and then you take this simple thing of like money ought to look like email rather than looking like legacy colonialist finance and you wind up in a position um, where a very good idea becomes inexorably wedded to a very bad idea. Right. right. And this is the great tragedy of Bitcoin. Right. The great tragedy of Bitcoin is let's overthrow the government with our magic internet money. And that's what I immediately got into it because I w was researching the Fed and all the, all the monetary policy and stuff. But at the same time, as I've progressed in research, it's not the end all be all. You know, it's not the magic pill. Well, I mean, you know, it might turn out to be the magic pill in the same way that Wikipedia was the magic pill. Ah, I see, I see. Right? Okay, okay. You know, it might be that thing which displaces all previous forms of knowledge, but it is in itself not perfect. Right, right. Right. You know, there's, there's still editors that fuck th with things. You know, etc. Yeah. Right. But you know, there's no denying that Wikipedia is so much better than what came oh. before. Everything else is obsolete. Just as a, a quick aside, when I was in high school, when it first came out, we were shunned away from using it because it wasn't, you know, legitimate. You know, because there were so many other things. But then, you know, give it 15 years, and then now it's like, like again, just looking up things about history or something like that, you get a, a pretty decent, you know, kind of mm. truth or knowledge or whatever you want to call it. And it's updated now. Right? Yes, I mean, yes. something happens on TV, you look it up on Wikipedia, there's already a page. Oh, yeah. Uh, and you, know, you go back 20 minutes later and they've corrected the errors, and it's amazing, right? Yeah. So, you know, if, if they had gone out and the Bitcoin story had not been locked onto by naive libertarians that then proceeded to drown in a puddle, it would have been fine, right? Mm -hmm. But instead, they set themselves up in direct opposition to forces which are so enormously powerful and sophisticated that they kind of looked at this rabble that was like, rah, 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 you know, it's the right. state, we're going to enter our own money with the Federal Reserve, right? And, you know, the powers that be kind of looked at that and were just like, uh, can anybody find the hammer? <laughs> you know, like, no, we don't have the hammer. Okay, well, just the fly swatter? Okay, that'll do, you know. <laughs> and, you know, it didn't take much to break the global charge of Bitcoin, yeah. right? It took, you know, the New York bit license and a little bit of pressure on taxing and a bit of um, but mostly it was self-defeating, right? Mm. Because the rhetoric that they came out with was f very, very viral and infectious for a quarter of a percent of the population and completely turned everybody else off. Right. And as a result, we've wound up in this massive gutter of adoption for blockchain where everybody that's got the right psychographic is in and everybody else is like, those people are weirdos. Right, right. And we've, you know that crossing the chasm diagram yes, that you've yes. got, right? So right now, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum and the whole blockchain space is in the depths of the chasm crossing. Right. Right? And, you know, everything is dying, right? You know, there are a handful of systems which will remain integ integral through that. But like the entire sort of altcoin field. Oh, the ICOs from two years ago? Like, it's all dead. Right? <laughs> Not even here anymore. They're all dead, <laughs> right? And the prosecutions haven't even started yet. Right, 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 right. 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 Exactly, Everyone, of all the money that, oh yeah, good the, point. the SEC is apparently queuing up 1,200 litigations. <laughs> because everybody that sold, right, dodgy looking coins to Americans, they don't let people get away with that, yeah, right? Yeah. So. You know, that, that mess occurs because of the political naivety, mm -hmm. right? If the early Bitcoiners had really had their game together, it wouldn't have been, this is an alternative to the dollar and we're going to smash the state. It would have been, this is the email of money. Right, right, right. right. The, internet's the internet is amazing. You'll love the internet. The internet has just learned a new trick. Remember when we could put images into web pages and that was new? Then you could put sound into web pages right. and that was new. Then you could put video into web pages and that was new. Now you could put money into web pages. <laughs> Isn't this amazing, right? It is. And if they'd stuck with the internet learns a new trick narrative, right, they would have slid directly into the mainstream without a glitch. So my question to you, and this is an inter this this was more when I began. It was going to be more of a funny thing to hear about what your thoughts. But then now this kind of comes into maybe this was a partial reason, but maybe not. So is we'll we'll get your take on it. Is who do you think Satoshi Nakamoto is? Do you think it's Hal Finney? Do you think it's a consortium of, of folks that just have 
a, a pledge of silence, a blood <laughs> pact that we're never going to do this again? Because I, but my point is that maybe the figurehead, there's no figurehead to yeah. kind of yeah. take down, et cetera. Oh man, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> so Are embarrassing. you Satoshi Nakamoto? Uh, you know, I, I did at one point have to write a disclaimer. <laughs> um, you know, I am not now, nor have I ever been Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> so I, 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 I just have to, right? So the people I know that are best informed about this, that have the best probability of actually knowing, point at Craig Wright and say that Craig Wright was one of about half a dozen people that did this. Right. Now, I wasn't there, I don't know. Yeah, how can you? <laughs> right, the Ethereum community hates Craig Wright with a supernatural passion, right? I, I once saw Vitalik drop the flying elbow at a conference, and like, Vitalik really doesn't get up in public and yell at people. And except to get him. <laughs> except Craig Wright, right? <laughs> so, nonetheless, the people I know that were most likely to have actual knowledge Point or right and say right was one of the gang that did it. Yeah. Right? I don't know who the other members of that gang were. Um, so that's that's what I've got in terms of like people that might have knowledge. Sure. In terms of my conjecture, if we take those accounts and just discount them for a second, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would have said it would have formed in the ashes of Eagold. Oh, you know? Eagold, yes. Oh, well, from how? Yeah, right? of course. All those crypto people were Absolutely. around. They were all networked. They all knew each other. It was a good proof of concept, but then it didn't really get it going. Federal, federal government comes and shuts yeah, it down. Just like <laughs> and you could imagine the Eagold guys, you know, the staff and the power users and a bunch of the crypto people that were hanging around. Right? I mean, by then, I'd been in energy policy for five years. Mm -hmm. So I was well off the radar. It wasn't me. <laughs> but I can imagine the Eagold guys sitting around and just being like, well, that sucked. How do we make sure this doesn't happen next time? And in the ashes of the 2008 financial crash as well. well like, you, you see, have to take right? that into account. Absolutely, right? Yeah. I mean, Eagle, I think, goes down in 05, 08, the financial crash. Boom. So you can imagine smart people sitting around just being like, okay, we have to do something. Right. Result is Bitcoin. So I would have said, you know, I mean, you could look at the 50 or 20 people that had good crypto skills around the Eagle community. In all probability, some of those people would have been involved, whoever put the thing together. Right. Um, but my, yeah, I mean, my gut feeling is that we, we don't know. I'm sure the feds know. Mm. Apparently, it wasn't important enough to prosecute anybody. And th that should give us a pretty strong idea about how little the federal government cares. Right. Right? To them, it's just another class of financial fraud, and they'll trim off the fraud in one bit. The non-fraudulent bits will be allowed to run as long as people aren't losing their houses on it. Yeah, and then I think it will be baked into the architecture behind the scenes that more people, well, it's more of a blockchain kind of thing that you don't really see. It's woven into the banking exactly. system. Libra is super interesting. So I have a feeling that Libra was built to fail. Right. Well, did you see the today? I saw eBay, Microsoft, all those. Yeah, are they're all just pulling out. Yeah, they're, they're running out. in the other they're direction. <laughs> um, but I think Libra was actually floated by Facebook as something that they intended the federal government to kill. Ah, I see. Right. Okay. I think okay. I think Facebook basically said, "Look, the feds are going to hit us," right? And I think it was basically a sacrificial lamb where they took something, they didn't put very much energy into it, they didn't put very much money into it. Oh, it was within they six months or so right? that it was up and down. And they just let it out, yeah. and then the regulators just smashed it flat, yep. and now Facebook could just be like, oh, oh, the federal government, oh, we're so <laughs> afraid, and go back to doing right they were doing before. Right. So I, I think totally. it really was built just to protect Facebook's core business, because the feds were going to hit Facebook, they have now hit Facebook, Facebook has been publicly spanked, Yeah. Uh, and now they can you know, turn around to the next federal regulator and be like, but of course we're compliant, we're so chagrined. Yeah, we did this, yeah. And so moving on from Bitcoin, um, in 2015 you helped coordinate uh, Ethereum, which is another cryptocurrency, uh, to the valuate, or the launch, and it was valued at $70 you know, billion. So can you talk about that experience and then thoughts on Ethereum now? I know that Materium, we're going to talk about that, that's based on the Ethereum protocol, but mm -hmm. what was that kind of experience like for the last, you know, seven years? Um, so I, I had been kind of pattering around the corners of kind of defense academia, disaster mm -hmm. relief, infrastructure, charities, you know, water, sanitation kind of space for many years at that point. And uh, I was going broke, right? The economy was going to hell. All the little niches I'd been occupying were kind of drying up. The work mm -hmm. just wasn't coming in. Um, and I felt like, you know, I should go and get a job in tech. 
right? Yeah. You know, I'm a programmer, I'm an architect, I can do this stuff, right? I'd been watching Bitcoin very carefully, um, but I knew that a currency alone wasn't enough. We needed the rest of the financial infrastructure. We needed the ability to build other financial infra instruments. We needed the ability to build structure. And you can't do that with just a payment rail. Right. Uh, and then I hear, hear the term smart contracts coming up again. Mm -hmm. And smart contracts were like the high watermark of cryptography in the first wave. Right. It was like, oh yes, one day there will be a smart contract. And so I hear this and I'm like, okay, that's my ship. So I go over and I'm just like, hey, I can do stuff, what do you need? And there was a, a decision about was I going to go on the technical side or was I going to go on the comms side? Yes, yes, yes. Could have gone either way. Did I want to be a programmer or did I want to be doing comms? So the comms team was in London and I was already in London and the tech was in Berlin. So I decided that I was going to stay in London and do the comms thing. Uh, and the comms thing was really building on top of a whole bunch of experience that I'd had about trying to communicate complex systems stuff to a general public. Mm -hmm. So I get well dug in on the comm side of Ethereum, spend a bunch of time on that, and then as we get closer to launch, you know, there's this sense of like, um, yeah, we also need some kind of project management pairs of hands. Right. And I was probably 15 or 20 years older than almost everybody on the team. <laughs> right, because yeah, I mean, they were all be, young. V Vitalik was what, 23? Uh, Vitalik was like, 20. Okay, but even, even younger. I yeah. mean, he's like 23 now. Now. <laughs> like, yeah. he, was, he was young. Um, and a lot of the other people were too. So, you know, that's not a bad position to be doing project management from. Right. Because you've seen a lot of stuff go wrong over the years and you tend to flap less. Um, so I just kind of sat in the middle of it and, you know, just held together some of the processes and just helped the thing along and then we launched. Right. Uh, and then not much happened for a year. Um, I went to Consensus Systems in New York, worked yep. for Joe Lubin for a while, uh, and then Ether went through the freaking roof. Oh, yeah. um, and I had taken legal advice at the Dow crisis. Mm. So I'm like, okay, I don't really understand what just happened there, but I have a bad feeling about this. And I sat down with some lawyers in London, and they said, Vinay, have you heard of a thing called securities fraud? Mm. And I'm like, pardon? They're like, you're basically acting as one of the front men for something that has just released an unlicensed security to people including the American public. Mm -hmm. You kind of have two choices here. You could, you know, at least you weren't there for the crowd sale, right? You joined after the crowd sale was over. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, that will help, but you can't be in a position where you're going to massively profit from this at the same time as you're selling it to people. Ah, uh, of course, the conflict right? of interest. Conflict of interest, yeah. right? So you can either divest or you can move to a jurisdiction without an extradition treaty. And I'm like, you what? That's going to cost me tens of millions of dollars. These are your choices. Mm. So I divested. Yeah. Really early on in the process. And that decision directly leads to Materium. Right. Because, you know, I was probably the only person in that game, other than people like Lubin who had come out of the financial services industry, they even understood that what we were doing might be of interest to regulators. Right. Right. And the people that were really old school financial services types were like, you know, new financial products always break the law. And it, as long as it doesn't turn out to be fraud, what happens is that the regulators will come along and grandfather in like, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. We've got to update the law. Right, right. It's good enough for the rest of the people. It's but they valuable. Were always used to t they were always used to taking that risk because it turns out in financial services, all of the money is made doing things which are currently illegal. And then you either go to jail or the regulators say, actually, that wasn't fraudulent and we need to update the regulations because that's just business. Right, right. Um, but I looked at the situation and was just like, you know, I've seen several rounds of the crypto wars. We've lost every round. I'm not going to stick my neck out on that chopping block this time. Right. Not even for tens of millions of dollars. Right. Uh, and with hindsight, was that the right thing to do? Probably not. Well, at least financially, but I mean, with Ethereum's. But we'll see what happens after the SEC works its way through the ICO crowds. Very right? true. Very you know, true. It's, it's a very tricky frontier, mm -hmm. right? Because most of my co-workers walked out set for life, right? And I walked out with enough money to start a company. Yeah. Right? And th that trade-off and the positioning relative to the regulators and the balancing of it, you know, it's that thing where looking for a very specific shade of meaning here. Um, having seen the crypto revolution crash and burn a couple of times, 
I wanted to be in a position where I could walk out of the wreckage and not be screwed. A little resiliency. Right. Yeah. Uh, and depending on which way the regime in Washington decides that they're going to shut down, and I stress that very strongly, depending on what way the regime in Washington decides they're going to shut down, the anonymous financial system will affect whether or not the people that walked out of these systems with a lot of money keep it or wind up having to return it to the original investors, mm. Mm -hmm. right? right? Because there's no way that the security bureaucracy in Washington is going to allow a parallel anonymous financial system to run alongside of the real financial system, right. right? This is back to this question of like, hey, it's like email for money versus, hey, we're gonna tear down the state. If you announce that you're going to tear down the state and then you fail to tear down the state, the state will tear you down. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's where all this stuff is, right? Yeah. All that stuff about you know Zuckerberg getting whacked on the nose and told to hand over the keys to Washington, exactly the same keys that are protecting your messaging that Washington wants Facebook to hand over, those are also the keys that are protecting your Bitcoin. Yeah. So it's yeah. only a matter of time until Washington comes from the Bitcoin keys as well. Yeah. Right? And you know, this is the hard, hard, hard truth, which is that if you announce that you're revolutionaries and then you fail, you will get squashed. Yeah. And what I'm attempting- Because you, you basically draw attention to yourself. You, yeah. You've set the table stakes, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. You know, like we're, we're in to win it, right? <laughs> it's war, well, okay, fine, <laughs> right? Um, and so you know, we're at risk of losing so much of the technological progress that's been made in these domains, because of this, you know, shallow libertarian and rant crap. Right. Right? You know, like, we do need a way of synchronizing the world's computers, or we cannot do south-south trade, we cannot build efficient second-hand markets, right? We, we can't make the internet carry financial services stuff unless we figure out how to do this stuff properly. Totally. Right? Mm -hmm. But because of this, you know, anti-state oppositional positioning that was so much of the early branding of Bitcoin, you know, of course the feds will eventually take notice of that. Sure. Um, so I kind of feel like what I'm doing right now is fighting a bit of a rear guard action to try and cleanly separate out the real utility of these technologies from the naive political branding around them. Right. You know, I'm really kind of just working a chisel along that line. Um, because uh, a global blockchain solution for karma management, it's all the same technologies, mm -hmm. right? it solves an enormous global problem that cannot be solved with existing financial architecture, mm -hmm. right? And it, it's a very blockchain-shaped problem, right? right? So I can easily imagine that 15 years from now, half of the global economy runs on a carbon accounting system that runs on a thing which looks like a blockchain. Right. I can easily see that from here, right. but the original libertarian vision of Bitcoin has to die to make room for something that actually works. Well, and then so in 2017, you became, you basically founded Materium, and then maybe, um, I'm just gonna say some words that basically like, or some phrases that, uh, that mm. kind of comes from it. So humanizing the singularity, organizing the world's property and making it universally acceptable and useful. And then uh, this is from the white paper, turning code into law. Mm. So, and then it asks basically, or answers, what if code really did have the force of law behind it? And so I guess talk about how, I mean, how you first uh, really just said, yep, this is what's happening from the Ethereum. Mm -hmm. But then as well, maybe you want to preface it from what is a smart contract? Because sure. maybe some people wouldn't be familiar yeah. with that. That's a, yes, that's a really great question. Let me do a little framing and then we'll get yeah, to the smart for contract. Sure, for sure. So this idea of, you know, let's email money around, right? If you think of this whole blockchain thing as the next media type that the internet eats, you know, Netflix eats TV, Spotify eats radio, mm -hmm. right? Bitcoin should have just eaten backing, ah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it should just have been the Californian ideology rolls over another industry, mm -hmm. no hiccup, right? But because of all this libertarian crap on the front end of it, it basically covered itself in antibodies and then injected itself into the bloodstream and everybody said no. Whereas if it had just been like, hey, the internet does money, everybody would have said yes, yes. <laughs> right? And you know, it's a strategic blunder of the worst kind, right? It's, you know, it's already set the technology back half a generation, but the technology is so good that it's survived, and this is the underlying philosophical split between the people that say blockchain and the people that say Bitcoin, right? right? But it hasn't been made fully explicit, right? right? And I, I, you know, oh, it, it's, it's just, 
you get to a fork in the path and you have to pick a side. Yep. Right? Um, so then we come along to this whole question of code is law, mm -hmm. right? If we're going to have a system where we're emailing money to each other, okay, it'd be nice if we didn't wind up getting caught up in somebody else's legal system every time we did that. Absolutely, every sovereign state. Yeah, yeah, right? yes, exactly. Yeah. Because I don't know where you live because I'm just emailing you money. Right. <laughs> and if it turns out that it breaks the law in the jurisdiction that I send it to, you're gonna get into trouble because I emailed you money. Right. Uh, this is not helping us, right? Yeah. So it'd be nice if we had some sensible approach to jurisdiction. Yes. Something that would give us some ability to handle this as a set of contingencies. So think of something like consumer protection law in Germany. Mm -hmm. Germany has incredibly strong consumer protection law. Mm -hmm. un just unbelievably strong consumer protection. Um, so there are lots of things which if you did them in America wouldn't raise an eyebrow, but in Germany, the person that you've sold the goods to could just be like, I changed my mind, take this back, give me all my money, mm -hmm. right? And so you need some way of knowing that you're doing business in Germany even though you're just sending money to somebody over the internet. Right. That's a problem for a computer. Right, right, right. It's not for you and I to keep up with and continue to think of. Yes, right. Yes, in yes. an ideal world, a piece of software yep. understands I'm in Belize, you're in Berlin, right? I send you the money in exchange for you sending me, you know, your, your uncle's cufflinks or whatever it is, <laughs> yeah. right? And, you know, a, a little message pops up on our computers and this is, by the way, you know, you realize this will be regulated by consumer protection laws and the person on the other side of the deal has 30 days to change their minds. Right. End of discussion. You want to escrow the money in this instance rather than make the payment because a return may be demanded. Yep. Okay, fine, now we're compliant. Right. right. It's a job for a machine. And it's a job for the, a machine in exactly the same way that route planning is a job for a machine. Right? You get your phone out, it's got GPS, it tells you how to get where you're going when you get off a plane in some place you've never been before. Right? You, know, you get on this bus and you get a ticket here and you go there and you do this thing. Perfect, right? mm -hmm. that's what you want. Not integrated enough that I can just make the payment for the tickets on my phone, but boy howdy, that's the next step. Yep, right? it is. Get off a place I've never been, buy me ticket, tell me where I go, get off of this bus, get on this train, get on that bus, now you're at your destination. Yep. Right? Or if you prefer to get an Uber, because Uber, of course, does let you pay for the ticket mm, yes, wherever yes. you are in the world, mm -hmm. on the same device, in the same interface, on the same infrastructure. Yep, as see we've I'm, been even using here in London. See what I'm yeah. saying, right? So how much of that process is just that you're in this kind of mystical Uber jurisdiction where wherever you are in the world, Uber works the same way, but public transport works a different way? Yep. Right? you'll pay because it just is the same everywhere you go. Same thing with Airbnb, right? Mm -hmm. There's a pseudo jurisdiction in which it doesn't matter where you are, the user experience is the same. That's what we want from internet money. Yep. We just want money that works the same wherever you are. Mm -hmm. And some combination of software and bureaucracy takes out all the lumpy bits to leave you with a uniformly smooth experience, mm -hmm. right? That's what we need to do next. Right. Now, this gets us to this question of smart contract. Right? Um, if you're going to be producing systems at this level of complexity, you need to be able to automate not just the payment, but you need to be able to automate the contract around the payment. Yes, the entire, from beginning to, to end. So yeah. it's a single yeah. smooth system. Yep. Right? So, you know, b because I mean, this sounds completely naive, but all of the money in the world lives inside of contracts or similar legal containers, mm. right? Other than like, you know, spare change in your trouser pocket, everything else is wrapped up inside of legal agreements, right? right? Your income that comes in, comes inside of a set of employment agreements. You know, when you make a payment to the power company, you know, that's inside of a 60 page contract you signed when you signed up with PG&E. <laughs> um, you know, if you give money to a charity, you know, as soon as you drop that coin into the jar, it's suddenly covered by a different regulatory structure than when it was spare change in your pocket. Right, right, right. right, right. You know, as soon yes. as it crosses the horizon, it's now, you know, it's the Charities Commission, it's a 501c3, it has to demonstrate what it did with your money, there's yep. an accountability chain. Mm -hmm. Like, money almost never exists in a free state, mm -hmm. right? It's always trapped inside of some kind of um, uh, contractual container or legal container, mm -hmm. right? So if we just model money, but we don't build a software analogy of all those legal containers and all those contractual containers, 
all the legal and contractual containers exist exactly the same way they did before. We get very little benefit from automating money. Right, right. right. If Bitcoin just allows me to make payments, but every single one of those payments is accompanied by a 60-page paper contract, how far forward are we? Right, 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 right. And then that's especially true when we're moving into like basically redesigning, you know, the, as you said, the enterprise resource planning for the circular economy. Because with climate change and stuff, we have to know what what information is talking to what other information because mm -hmm. now basically we've allowed things to either A, slip through the cracks or B, not being looked at because people have enough money. But then in this, in your kind of Materium asset passport, it's more of a trust model. Mm -hmm. It's more of a really kind of saying, well, this is that and that's what it is. And then everyone can kind of agree on that or speak on that. Well, I mean, so here we get back to this whole question of anti-colonialist finance, right? The whole take, make, waste cycle Right, which is at the heart of you know, the economy that we have, right? you cannot separate the Industrial Revolution from colonialism. Mm -hmm. right? The raw materials that were processed in the factories produced goods which were then sold back to the third world countries. Right. Right? You know, the cotton comes from one place, it's spun into cloth, and then it's sold to India. Right. Right? So that machinery, the financial system and the industrial system and the colonial system, it was a single system. And that was the system of the world for, I don't know, three centuries, right? So when we start trying to re-engineer this for post-colonialist world, right? Okay, the colonial thing is rapidly in the decline and something else is emerging and it's mm -hmm. more, I don't want to say it's any fairer or more egalitarian, but it's more balanced. It's less unipolar, mm, that's a good right? Word. Balanced, you yeah. kind of come up into this multipolar world and you know, the Arabs have all of their oil money and the Chinese have all the manufacturing power and you know, e Europe has all of this weird high-tech industry and finance and services stuff and America's still doing this huge mass production thing and you know, everybody's kind of good at what they're good at. Whereas in 1970, America was 70% of the world's manufactured goods. Oh yes, of course. Right? Yes, America yes, yes. was America and it was China and it was half of Europe. Mm -hmm. you know? No wonder life was good in the 1970s in America. Um, or ordinary people working on production lines in America were making the equivalent in modern money of a more than seventy dollars an hour. Wow. Right? That was That's for th right. That was for production line jobs, because they had five percent of the world's population, twenty five percent of the world's uh, resources, but seventy percent of the world's manufacturing. Mm. So mm. you know that was how that seventies generation could afford. You know, a sort of four-bedroom house with a three-car garage. Yeah, totally. The American dream. The American dream, right? <laughs> because it was the the productivity was off the charts. Yes. Right? Yes. Now everything's very diffused out. It's much more complicated. It's much more confusing. It's much more difficult, right? Um, because the world is multipolar, right? People have to negotiate. The prices are for raw materials are rising. The amount of latitude that you know the powers, the incumbent powers have, is falling. Mm -hmm. When you redesign a, a, a financial, not even a financial system, when you redesign a trade system for that multipolar world, you can't have 50% of the world's resources being traded on a single exchange in America. Boom, yes. Right? Things like high frequency trading no longer make sense because it's not that we lug all of our goods to Rome and then we trade them in the Roman markets and then we lug all the silver home again. Right. If I'm going to trade you know, coffee from Beijing to you know uh, Ethiopia, right? Why am I going to do that deal in Connecticut? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. See what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. So <laughs> the inevitable movement towards a multipolar trade architecture, right? That's payments, mm -hmm. right? It's contracts, mm -hmm. it's commercial law, mm -hmm. and all of this is built directly on the back of containerization. Mm. So oh yes, shipping containers. Shipping uh, containers, yeah, right? Yes, yes. Shipping containers were worth something like seven percent of global uh, gross domestic product. It wow. was a gigantic jump in fundamental economic efficiency, mm -hmm. right? So that happens. Then we have the globalization of finance, which happens in really the eighties. Another huge jump forward. Then we get the internet. Another huge jump forward. There's an inevitable progression of globalization because it just turns out we live in one world and systems which accept that we live in one world work better than systems that pretend that we don't. Right, absolutely, because it's more the reality that we're facing. It's and the earth. Right? <laughs> like it's the earth, right? <laughs> You're just Literally. closer to the line of nature. Yeah. Right? So that's kind of the perspective that I look at this whole blockchain thing from, right? right? Computer systems, which are intended to operate globally, have to take the speed of light delay into account. That means they have to operate in blocks. Right. 
oh, the blockchain is inevitable. If you're going to build a global trade architecture, right, it ought to be possible for two people in the world to trade with each other without it having to go through a third party. Yeah, clearing house right? or something. Yeah. Which moves the deal into another legal jurisdiction. Yep. Right? Yep. If I'm in Belize and I want to wire money to Bolivia, but the money has to go through an American bank on the way, why are we going to pay for the privilege? And the Americans are going to make the rules. Mm. Right? In a multipolar world, the Americans are not going to make the rules, and neither are the Chinese. Mm. And n neither are the folks in Dubai. That's right? so true. If you're going to do South-South trade, the only laws that should pertain to the transaction are the laws of the two countries which are trading with each other. Right. Right. If if I'm not doing, um, you know, coffee to, Eth uh, you know, Ethiopian coffee to China, if I'm doing Ethiopian coffee to South Africa, why should that deal be brokered anywhere other than in one of those two countries? Absolutely. See what I'm saying? Yep. Yep. So when you start talking about decolonizing finance, what we're talking about doing is building a financial architecture for global trade which is point-to-point -point efficient rather than constantly rooting the trade through third-party marketplaces. And then that brings us to basically what are uh, climate change and environmental and social issues that literally are all mostly, or not all, but mostly based on inefficiencies. Well, I, they're mostly based on shit flows downhill. Well, yeah, right? that as well. Yeah. So, you know, that tendency to just take the stuff at one end by force and then dump the toxic waste back in some other third jurisdiction. And no one pays for that value. Right. All of those systems are breaking down because the people on both sides of those deals have kind of had enough of it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and you know, if you've got the choice where you either sell your goods to the Americans or you don't sell them at all, you're stuck. Yeah. But if you could sell them to the Americans, the Europeans, or the Chinese, now you have some trading power. Right, right, right. right. So all of this stuff is about you have to change the architecture of finance and trade for a multipolar world. Right. For a world of a South-South trade, for a world where people buy and sell things internationally, right? If you're some Brazilian kid and you're a member of some weird subculture that happens to be big in Finland. Oh, sure. Yeah. Right? And you want to buy physical goods, like a band t-shirt. Sure. Right? You want to buy a band t-shirt, or let's take like Sigurd Ross, right? Okay. Fans all over the world, the band lives in Iceland. If you want to buy a Sigurd Ross t-shirt in Brazil or Mexico, you're probably going to have to buy it internationally. Yeah. Right? Is it going to come from America or is it going to come from, from Iceland or is it going to come from somewhere else? Yeah. You don't care, you just want the band t-shirt. Yeah. Right? But our entire trade architecture assumes that that shirt will come from America. Right. The IP will go from Iceland to America, then you'll produce it in America, then America will ship it to Brazil and that's how it's going to get done. Right. That's not the way it's going to work in future because it's super inefficient. And because the price is higher if you do it in the slack way rather than in the tight way. Totally, totally. Right? So that's how I really view this whole blockchain thing, is it's just building out a software architecture that can support a financial architecture, that can support a trade architecture that works in the real world, rather than in the fantasy of the 1950s, which is basically how the world still operates. Right. It's an update for modernity. Yeah. And that includes all of these limitations where you know, if the money flows in one direction, we should probably push the environmental consequences in the other direction. You know, like, I sold you a bunch of coal, and I get the money, but you get the CO2, because you bought the coal, and you're going to burn the coal, so you take the 200,000 tons of CO2 that goes with my coal. Right. right? Okay, now you're stuck with the 200,000 tons of CO2. Now you've got to get rid of that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to pay you to plant all of these trees, and then I'm going to sell you the CO2, and then you're going to cancel the CO2 with your green score. Ah. No, there's a business model. Right. That carbon credit thing has been discussed for 30 years at this point. Right. <coughs> but if you're going to build a global economy that worked on carbon credits and actually worked, what's the technology going to look like? A lot like blockchain of some sort, or right. and at least in a, a flavor. It's <laughs> exactly. <laughs> a flavor. Like something like yeah, that. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's like we want to run a global system and we don't want one country to make law for all the other countries because the deals are done in their soil and da 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 da. Yeah. You just kind of work your way down the chain of cause and effect and you wind up with something which blockchain solves all of those problems. Right? It doesn't solve the speed problem, but it solves the internationalization, globalization, trade problem really effectively. Yeah. And then it, at least it brings to light of things that previously were either by capital or by people just putting down, it, like you said, inefficiencies. But then mm -hmm. even so, it's not being shown up into the system as, as, a vi as a visible thing to most consumers, most people. Like, they just don't know, you know? They don't know, but, but we've been through this with music, mm. right? We've been through this mm. with cinema, 
right? Good points. You know, if you look on Netflix, how much stuff is there on Netflix which is like weird Chinese shows that have been dubbed into English, <laughs> right? And there's a bunch of that stuff. It's yeah. really good. Weird Indian shows, many of which were made in English. That stuff is great, right? There's a lot of that too. Um, you know, if you're a kid today and you're left alone on the internet, you're not mostly going to consume things... Actually, I shouldn't say that. You're going to consume vastly more stuff from other people's cultures without realising it than any previous generation would. Right. You're going to watch what you find interesting, and if it turns out to be you know, Japanese cats with pancakes on their head, <laughs> right? You're not really caring that this stuff is coming from Japan and it's being shipped across all of these boundaries, cultural, economic, etc. Because eventually you get it. Yeah. And it's on the internet and it's just there. Right? Yeah, yeah. So making manufactured goods work that way has to be what people want. Mm. Right? We love it for information, we love it for cultural artifacts, we love it for music, we love it for work. All these kids are, you know, doing website design for places in one country while they're living in a second country and they come from a third country and all their, you know, that, the, all of these life cycle styles. Globalization for the people is really happening. Right. And we just need to upgrade, upgrade the trade architecture to match that. Mm -hmm. And so something that uh, Materium is, is developing right now is basically a proof of concept with some of these um, trust models is, uh, and it deals with our old friend from Star Trek, uh, William Shatner and his collectibles, and then also the Stradivarius guitar, uh, violins, excuse me. So talk, talk uh, about how this like, proof of concept is moving forward. Okay, so we have this kind of philosophical realization that the blockchain is the natural architecture for the internet of money, mm -hmm. right? We basically sever the libertarian story from the head end of that. Mm -hmm. They've had a shot, it hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. Maybe if the dollar collapses, Bitcoin does go to $5 million, but I don't think that's how this goes, right? <laughs> um, you know, let's just see what happens with that, though. <laughs> but assuming that we don't see a complete crash of the global financial system and a rebasing onto Bitcoin, that doesn't mean it's the end of the blockchain story. Mm. Because you still need a global computer system, yes. which enables point-to-point -point trade without going through massively expensive international third parties, yeah. right? You know, 50% of the world's commodity trading is done in you know, high frequency trading systems, and those high frequency trading systems are mostly in America. Mm -hmm. There's no way that that's going to be true in 20 years. Ah, uh, yes. Right? Uh, we are almost looking through the looking glass of yeah. what's coming. It, yes. It's just inevitable, like why would the Chinese and the Europeans trade all of their commodities in America, yeah. put all of their money and all of their assets under American law, leave a chunk of it on the table in the States, like th there's no way that continues, yeah, right? Yeah. Eventually you're going to wind up with a globalization of trade and the globalization of trade requires a system where everybody is participating on the same basis. Yes. And that transformation takes you into architectures that look like blockchain, yep. right? It, it, it's, I, mean, I, I, can't, I can't stress enough how inevitable it is because if you politically decentralize, you can't then technically decentralize without dealing with the speed of light problem. Mm, and we're still in that physics problem. You see yes, what I'm saying, yes, right? Yes, yes. So you know, the, the shift of geographic power where everybody has control in their own country and then we network immediately exposes you to this problem that you can't synchronize the computers. Right, right, right. right? So whereas if it's all happening inside of a single trading location, like, okay, this, machine, this building in Connecticut, that's the commodities exchange, that's where all the deals happen, mm -hmm. which is basically the current architecture, those kind of models are cut and dried. You move the money, you move the authority into one building, all the computers are on cables which are measured to the millimeter, job is done, yep. right? If you're going to have all that decision making and all those you know, trade happening in the countries where the assets live, those countries are far apart, you have a light speed delay, you can't use that kind of architecture, you need a different architecture. The only computer systems that we have that are really compensated for this light speed delay problem are blockchain systems yep. or Google Spanner, but you can't use that for trade. Okay. Right? Um, so, you know, this is, the, this is the inevitability of something that looks like this, right? It's just inevitable. So the libertarian transformation of society was a hypothesis being tried, turns out that we're not rolling in that direction right now. On the other hand, the globalization of trade has been a fact for centuries. Mm -hmm. We've gone through four accelerations of that in recent history with containerization and finance and the internet and all the rest of this. There's no doubt about the direction of travel. So 
having seen all of that, the question then was how do we get skin in the game? How do yeah, we get sure. involved in that process? And we started out with a very ambitious, quite libertarian flavoured approach. This is kind of how we're going to do things. As the libertarian vision flagged last year, we began to realise that okay, there's very little chance that we're going to see this kind of global blockchain republic type thing come into existence. Yes. Yeah. The question was, okay, how do we maintain our grip on the global trade transformation, given that we're not going to be in the process of creating this kind of para-sovereign court structure? Mm. How do we do that? So what we decided was we were going to go right to the other end of the scale, still keep all of the original material concepts about rule of law, regulation, and smart contract, yep, yep. but apply them to things which are granular and atomic. Yes. Right? So what's the smallest unit of law that you want to travel with an object as the object is shipped around the world. And that's the definition of the object. Right, or authenticity of it. Or, right. Authenticity, so if the object is a collectible, it's authenticity. If the object is an engineering thing, then it's specification. Ah, if yes. the object is a commodity, then it's sourcing. Sure. Right. There, there are what, whatever it is that you're buying and selling, you've got different questions that you want to answer about that thing. Absolutely, right? yeah. But the reality and the auth and the integrity of the description of the goods is at the bottom of all trade. Right, right, right. right? Integrity, that's a great word for it, right. yes, yes. The money goes in one direction, we've got the payment rails, that's yeah. all fine, that's happening. Yeah. The information about the goods has to be accurate or you're sending the money into space. Right, yeah. right. So what we tried to do was build the anchor which was on the other half part of the deal. If we're going to send you Bitcoin or Ether or um, uh, you know, uh, a stable coin like the um, DAI or any one of these mm -hmm, things, mm -hmm. right? If you've got hard money going in this direction and it's landing on a target where the description of the goods is only 70% accurate, huge opportunity for fraud. Yeah, right? huge. If I'm sending squishy dollars, which are attach attached to the Visa chargeback system, mm -hmm. if the description of goods is 70% accurate, I don't like it, I make a chargeback. Mm. If we're operating in a blockchain system internationally, there is no chargeback. Mm. So the description of the goods has to be ironclad. Yes. And the trick here is that we move the insurance function from being associated with the payment rail, which is the visa model, yep. to being associated with the description of goods. Mm. So we wrap the insurance, in, in case something goes wrong, around the goods rather than attaching the insurance to the payment rail. Mm. Right. And th this gets into a kind of philosophical concept of repudiatability, right? Mm -hmm. So. If I send you money, but I have the ability to pull my money back, that's called a repudiatable payment. Sure. In that situation, you're taking the risk mm. because I send you the money, you send me the goods, I claw back the money, now I've got the money and the stuff. Yeah. The visa model. Mm -hmm. Non-repudiatable non -repudiable payments, I send you the money, I can't claw the money back, so now I send you the money, you don't send me the stuff, now you're left with the money and the stuff. Right. And that problem, Right. The entire global economy right now runs on repudiatable payments, right. which always leaves the power in the hands of the buyer. Right. Now, remember what I said about the colonial system, yep. where it's all trade at gunpoint. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In a trade at gunpoint system, where do you want the power to be? Mm. In the hands of the buyers, mm. because the sellers are the people that we just invaded. Oh yes, of course, because they have the different silk or whatever it is. Yes. See what I'm saying, yes, right? Yes, yes. So the, the very fact that the world runs on non-repudiated, on repudiatable payments, is part of the architecture of trade and colonialism. From, yes. Right. In societies before colonialism was a big thing, payments tended to be made in gold, mm -hmm. and were non-repudiatable. So if I walk into the shop and I hand you the gold and you hand me the goods and I walk out again, you've got the gold, end of story. And I can't come and ask you for the gold back unless I've got strong proof. Right. Yeah. So the very fact that we've got this repudiable payments architecture was about concentrating power in the hands of the colonial authority. Mm -hmm. Right. The wire transfer system, I've sent the money to Taiwan, but they didn't send me the goods. I'm taking my money back. Yeah. Screw those guys. <laughs> yes, sir. That's, of course, the way we will do it. Right. Right. You know, it, it, this is how deeply baked in these assumptions are. Totally. Right? So when we start tearing that stuff up, because the political power situation no longer supports that kind of architecture, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, 
I'm not going to send you my very nice handmade Japanese whatever it is because you're making a credit card payment because you could do a charge back. Oh, of course. We won't yeah. trade under those circumstances. Well, we will, but we'll jack our prices up to compensate. Yeah, and then we'll make sure that we're, we're good in this situation. And yes. it's all inefficiency. Yep. Right? Yep. So if we start into that kind of system, right, if we're going to move the insurance, right, if we go from repudiatable to non repudiatable payments, right, you get paid, you stay paid, we have to move the insurance function from being attached to the payment rail like it is in Visa to being attached to the definition of goods. Right. So you make me a promise that you're going to sell me this thing and it's authentic. Mm -hmm. I send you the money, but once you've got the money, I can't get my money back. If the goods aren't authentic, I have to be able to make a claim somewhere. Yeah. And I claim on your insurance. Mm. Right. And that is the architecture for creating a structure in which you can do trade globally, but the books will balance for people. Right. Now, yeah. all very highfalutin, what does this have to do with William Shatner? Yeah. Right? And the answer is, the collectibles market is huge. Yep. It's entirely driven by questions of authenticity. Mm -hmm. People will pay less for things that they want than they would otherwise because they're afraid that the thing that they're buying is not authentic, so the prices are artificially depressed for people that are selling real stuff and for people that are selling fakes. Mm -hmm. So the good vendors are being dragged down by the fake vendors. Right, and then right? that's not good for anyone. <laughs> and <laughs> if you can drive the fake vendors out of these markets, the prices for the goods rise. And will con be consistent to what the value is. Bingo, yeah. right? Because yeah. we're no longer trading at a discount because we don't trust the goods we're buying. Yeah. So it's an excellent market for really strong product information, mm -hmm. right? And okay, we don't expect people to be buying and selling goods using non repudiatable payments on blockchains as the mainstream approach to the collectibles market anytime soon. Right. But those same concepts about truth and trust and authenticity apply Absolutely. even in a situation where somebody's making a payment on something like Visa. Right. Right? Right. Because in that market, there is so much sketchy stuff going on that you can still burn a clean spot to great financial benefit. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one side of it. The other side of it is we just weren't going to say no to William Shatner, <laughs> right? I mean, good point. Good point. You know, <laughs> when we when when we were approached by Shatner uh, and his team, you know, there were a couple of different things that we could have done first. But after we had been approached by you know the Shatner operation, yeah. and you know it started with a direct message from William Shatner, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> he, he is talking to me. <laughs> uh, it was quite a shock. Yeah. But after that, you know, it was slightly like direction set. Yeah. Oh, because yeah. we weren't going to say no. Yeah. And with that as our first project, it was obvious the second project was also going to be somewhere in that space. Sure. So that is one of these path dependency moments where, you know, if the first thing that had happened had been the violin guys had said, okay, we're doing the violin, then we would have been talking about fine art and all the rest of this yes, stuff. Yes, yes, yes. As it is, the first thing that happens is, you know, the, the Shatner collectibles. And so that we're doing that, and that's what we're going to do. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> And that's fine because you know if you've got a fundamentally flexible underlying world model, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter what you do first because they're all examples of a fundamental principle. Right, right, right. right, right. So we've got this fundamental principle which is about you know, decolonized trade and fair exchange of goods and not routing things through third parties in developed countries and an internet of money and all the rest of these concepts. But at the end of the day, it boils down to I send you money, you send me stuff, and the stuff is what I paid for. Absolutely. Right. Okay. We'll do collectibles. Now. The other part about the collectibles market is collectibles generally have lots of different owners over their lifespan. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, a Stradivarius violin, it's not a collectible, it's an antiquity, but it, it's you know, 325, 350 years old. Many people have owned it in that time period. A lot of them have dotted around the world where they've been owned by people in different countries. They haven't stayed inside of a single family or a single region. Um, a lot of the time they're worth more because of how amazing their previous owners were. Right, because they kept it up, they kept the value going, etc. It's not just that, because if somebody incredibly famous owned the violin and played it for 25 years... Oh, I see. Yes, yes, yes. You're getting their history and their patina with the object. Absolutely. Right? This is not just an object which was made by Stradivarius. Uh, Stradivarius? Anyway. This is also an object which was played by Yehudi Menuhin. Right, right, right. Right? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Multiple layers. So the thing acquires value with each layer that's added to it over time. Sorry, right? Right. You know, if I have a Star Trek collectible, Okay, that's fine. I bought it directly from Mr. Shatner, right? Very good. <clears throat> then, if I happen to, to be, let's say, Keanu Reeves, and I bought this thing for <laughs> one of my friend's kids, 
two layers. Yes, right? two Ooh. layers. So that's the Shatner thing that was bought by Keanu Reeves. Ah. Yes, and then he gave it to you know his friend's kid as a birthday present. Yes, yeah. and now the friend's kid, you know, is going to top up their college fund off this thing, right, 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 right. And you know, so you wind up with these stories which weave themselves around the objects over time. Ah, oh, that's so interesting. Right. Yes, um, and that's a great case for blockchain because this gradual accumulation of knowledge and surface and patina, totally. it's the authenticity, but it's also the narrative that gets woven around the thing over time, makes the thing worth more than it was when we bought it. Wow. And this is decommodification. De right. right? I very strongly believe that the internet, or digital technology in general, pushes things to extremes, right? But it always pushes things to both extremes. Mm. Total transparency and total anonymity, rather than this kind of hazy gray area that you would get with cash transactions, right? right? Total privacy and total exposure. So the commodities are super commodity, right? You know, you go to Amazon, you type, I want to buy printer paper, it will show you 38 brands, you know they will all be identical, you click one, you're done. Yeah. But at the same time, it's also hyper-specific because if you're buying something from a dealer, you know, they'll have a web page where they detail every single little thing about that oh, object. Oh, of course, yes, yes, yes. In a way that they wouldn't have done before. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So both hyper-generic and hyper-specific. So we've seen the hyper-generic. The hyper-generic is everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now we have to build the hyper-specific as the counterbalance to the tendency of things to become generic. Yes, yes. Yeah. That's really the crux of it, right? Mm -hmm. We've built out all of the way in one direction in this kind of completely generic economy. The unique economy is very, very, very lagging. Yeah. Right? Because that's I mean, if, fertile for opportunity, though. Oh, it's gigantic. Yeah. I mean, and, and by gigantic, I mean like five or ten percent of global GDP Oof. gigantic. Wow. Right? Because if you think about this, right, everybody owns a mix of things which are generic and unique. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. The richer you are, the more unique you tend to own, but also the poorer you are, right? Handmade by my grandma who knitted it herself. Or hand, it's second hand, right? so yes, 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 yes. It's unique at one end of the spectrum, right? And this is a Picasso sketch, is unique at the other end of the spectrum, right? It's not rich and poor, you know, you, uh, generic and unique. It's actually that unique occurs both at the, at the rich end and at the poor end, end right? So the entire world of unique goods at the poor end, all that stuff is impossible to trade because nobody can identify what it is. Yep. Right? If you want to buy you know, a pair of wool and mittens and somebody wants to sell you a pair from Peru, yep. they're not well enough specified for you to be comfortable buying them mm -hmm. because you feel like you're kind of taking your chances. Mm -hmm. right? If they were well enough specified that you would know that they would fit your hands exactly and they're really made of the wool that they're said to be made of, and here's a picture of the granny knitting them and all the rest of it, mm -hmm you're probably willing to pay more for a pair of Peruvian mittens mitted by somebody's granny than you are for a pair of plastic mittens that came in a box from China. Yeah, and then was just mass produced in and a was box of 10,000. <laughs> because it's kind of cool and the mittens are actually better because wool is better than plastic and you know that somebody made them with craft and you can see the little stitches and you're like, oh, this is nice. That's right? an interesting example. I like that. <clears throat> so we, right now, you know, our, our mythical Peruvian grandmother, right, even if she's knitting them, she can't get your dollar for them, mm. right? She can sell them to an exporter who's buying them from 50 other women, yep. who's putting them in a box, who's selling them by the kilogram to some importer who runs some hippie store in Boulder, Colorado, <laughs> and sells them to tourists, <laughs> right? At which point our mythical Peruvian grandmother is making three cents on the dollar. Right. Why does she need the jerk in the shop to sell her stuff by the kilogram? Totally. Right. And the answer is, it's just an accident of colonial history. Mm. That mechanism is left over from when the trade was done at gunpoint. We just haven't updated it. So mm. if she takes full control of the marketing and the branding and all the rest of that stuff, th that will work. Mm -hmm. But still, how do we cut through the noise? Right. And the answer to that is software. Right. Right? So we did route finding for navigating around the world and for finding flights and all the rest of that. All that knowledge used to exist in the head of travel agents. Now it's a generic rails, right? Data rail, payment rail, data rail. So if our archetypal Peruvian grandmother, <coughs> who at this point is becoming quite tired, <laughs> right? Um, you know, if she takes pictures of her things, right? And some combination of some manual flagging and uh, some AI recognition, image recognition stuff says, you know, mitten, wool, 
you know, grey number 61, pink number 62, blue 53, uh, you know, 11 centimetres by 21 centimetres, we reckon they'll be about this warm. If we take apart the Each story, individual thing. Yes, yes, right? yes. Now we've got something that you can look for with a search engine. Mm. This is a photograph of my hand. I want a woolen mitten. Right. How would you like one from Peru? Bye. <laughs> Done. Done. And it shows up <laughs> later. Right? And, and your Peruvian grandmother gets more than three cents on that dollar. Because all that she's going to do is she's going to charge you $25, which is what you were going to pay for a pair of mittens. Anyway. And then they're going to take the shipping off that, and then she's going to keep all of it. That's good. fantastic. Right? That's so good. And that's what it looks like when you decolonize trade. Right? That's incredible. Because it, the whole thing of taking the raw materials from developing world countries, compressing them into bricks, shipping them internationally by weight, and then moving them out through distributor networks, that's the colonial trade architecture. Yeah, totally. Right? It's just a wealth concentration machine for the people on the upper end of that. And frankly, the poor folks are not going to sell under those terms if they've got any alternative. So you as the buyer are going to say that pay the same price for the goods, whether you buy them direct for her or whether you buy them from some hippie retailer. Right. right? Why are we supporting these people? Mm. They're not adding anything to the system. They were 200 years ago. Right. right? But times have changed. Time, <laughs> times have changed and trade hasn't. Right, right. So, you know, that's the South-South hypothesis, right? You take the objects, you define them in detail, you define them in ways which are trusted, you use computers to do a bunch of the searching, and that enables people to get fair price for their goods. <clears throat> that's at the low end of the spectrum. At the high end of the spectrum, there's, you know, $60 trillion of art and collectibles. Oh, yes. Right? It's about something like 10% of all human wealth mm -hmm. is in the form of things which are unique. Think about what's in the Vatican vaults. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Every art gallery in the world. <laughs> right? All of that stuff. All of that right? stuff. <laughs> so now again we get to the intercultural trade thing, right? Yeah. So Chinese uh, society is massively into Western classical music right now. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me why, but they've picked up a taste for it and they're really, really good at it. Because the Chinese, generally speaking, you know, you've got 1.3 billion people in a pretty efficient way of getting talent organized. Right, yes. Right? So in 1.3 billion people, you've got one-fifth of the world's great classical musicians and really good infrastructure for finding those people and getting them trained. Right? right? Yeah. So, you know, they're really turning into something of a force in classical music, which means they would like to buy some proper classical music violin stuff. And the best violins in the world are Stradivariuses or very close relatives of them. So the Chinese will not to buy some of these things. They don't really understand the Western dealer networks very well. Mm. Because, you know, imagine going to Beijing and trying to buy a pair of silk shoes. Right. How do you even tell whether you're buy what you're buying is quality? No clue. Or nonsense, right? Yeah. We just yeah. don't, you know, it turns out it's no easier for them than it is for us. And once you're out of the colonial model where you turn up with a gun and you say, give me the good stuff or I'll shoot your kids, you know, it just turns out that the quality control issues can't be resolved by force. They have to be resolved by negotiation. Yeah. This is paradigmatically completely new, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's only very recently that we've had to start negotiating with third world countries when we want to trade with them. Mm -hmm. Because the globalization has actually been accessible now. Like, the, there's, it's actually globalization. It's actually globalization because the people on both sides of the deal have power, so now it's a negotiation. Yeah. Totally, right? Totally. Rather than the sham of negotiation, which was the gunboat diplomacy, which, of course, the UK was the world's great innovator in. Mm. Right? And we were the masters of that story. <laughs> and, and that's how we built the British Empire, right? Yeah. At gunpoint. You can imagine the dialogues between the Indian parts of my family and the, you know, Scottish parts <laughs> of my family. I can imagine. So, you know, we get into this situation of the Chinese have enormous amounts of money because their economy is coming right up because they're really great at manufacturing and always have been, right? And Chinese manufacturing, they bankrupted Europe, right? Because Europe kept buying the silk and the porcelain and all the other amazing things that came out of China. They literally bankrupted Europe hundreds of years ago, mm -hmm. right? We've, we've almost completely forgotten that period where we did world change with China and they were just so much better at manufacturing than we were that they just spanked us. Right? So now the Chinese want to take some of their winnings from making all of our mobile devices and <laughs> everything else, right, and they right, want right. to turn those winnings into violins. Yeah. How do we know we're not going to get conned by these weaselly white guys? Yeah. Oh boy. Well, 
look, we've got a bunch of really ironclad legal guarantees about the quality of goods, mm -hmm. right? And if they've sold us a ringer, we will claim on their insurance and we will get all of our money back. That's so good. Now I can buy. Yeah. Right? And th this is what happens when you've got genuinely intercultural trade, yeah. right? We don't trust people from other cultures. We don't understand how to figure out which people in these other cultures we can trust because every culture has its eagles and its weasels, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, you start using legal liability at above the credit card level for separating out the good guys and the bad guys in other cultures. And then when you buy something from another culture, you buy from the good guys, right? right? The architecture trade. But to get that to work, the people inside of those cultures have to be able to make binding promises about the quality of the goods that they're selling you, mm -hmm. such that if those promises are broken, you actually get your money back, right. Right? plus something for your inconvenience. You're not going to do that with international litigation on the existing templates. Yeah, no. So you need an alternate system for managing trade globally in which people inside of the knowledge, right, inside of the loop, make the binding promises about the quality of goods, and then when I buy the goods internationally, I buy both the goods and the promise. <clears throat> and that's exactly how it works inside of collectibles. You as the dealer in Star Trek memorabilia understand that that really is William Shatner's signature. You sign off on the proof, you sell me the object, you sell me the proof. If the object is not as described, I claim on the proof. Right. And that's the material model. Right? It's, it's just a way of making it possible to buy things when you don't understand them as well as an expert. Okay, Vinay, so last question. Um, so the overview effect is the cornerstone kind of philosophy of eclectic spacewalk, um, and you said you're familiar with it. So if you had the opportunity where the, you were in the ISS or the moon or whatever, and the whole world was looking up at you, what would you say? Wow, it's a hard question. Yeah. Um, Not to put you just on the worldly spot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, so the hard part of this is philosophy of communication. Yes. Um, because, you know, you could say something to somebody, and if they are, you know, two steps away from that, it'll just bounce off, right? If they're one step away from it, they might take the next step. Mm -hmm. uh, and so much of the world is so wrapped up in its own affairs, you know. I mean, the the daily struggle for survival, even in rich countries, is all consuming. Mm -hmm. You know, we've really created a world where there's so much volatility and instability that it's not like you can find a niche and then basically get habituated. Right, right, right. You know, we're under constant adaptational stress in a way that I think is quite unnatural for our biology. Mm -hmm. You know, most of our ancestors, you know, and I'm talking about over the kind of two million year scale, would have lived in the same ecosystem as their grandparents had 50 generations before. Ah, much of the same. Right, well, you know, we've been, we've been at the side of this watering hole forever. <laughs> forever, right? <laughs> well, pretty much forever, yeah. yeah. And, you know, unless you've got climatic change, you know, your people had been in that environment forever, and then you would get the migrations, mm -hmm. right? But most, you know, the migrations are the exception, and the rule is that people would stay in one place and they'd eat the same things that their great-great-great-great-grandparents had because the environment hadn't changed, right. and they were the same people in the same place. Right? And now, because of this massive onrushing change, you know, people are smeared out in this world over about 600 years of time. You know, the, the, the difference between the condition of a medieval peasant and a modern European or American, you know, is about 600 years of transformation. And we've got people who are living in pre-transformation situations, mm -hmm. there's maybe half a billion of those folks, mm -hmm. in the same world as we've got people who are gonna, you know, working really hard on how they're gonna live 200 years. Right, right, right. You know, we're, we're so smeared out in time, literally six centuries, eight centuries, 10 centuries of change, that have happened to some humans and not to others. Right. Smeared out in time, smeared out in space, smeared out in culture. You know, when we start talking about a universal message, there's not a lot you can say, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, you, you sort of wind up at the kind of Bill and Ted, like, be excellent to each other. Yes. <laughs> Everyone can hear that, right? You know, it's like, well, yeah, okay, yeah, we okay. can understand that, right? <laughs> but you wind up having to work at such a general level. That's a good point, yeah. Because people are, you know, so incredibly smeared out in space and time. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think that this is something like, why is so much of the genuinely global phenomena, right? You know, when things become global phenomena, most of the global phenomena are really, really kind of vacuous, mm -hmm. right? 
and it's specifically because they're global. By the time you have communication, which can be heard by everybody simultaneously, it has to say something which is so general to the human condition that it's, it's going to be generic, right? Mm. And then the question is, is it deep or is it shallow? Mm. You know, generic shallow, we've got an awful lot of generic shallow, mm -hmm. right? You mm -hmm. know, every culture takes its prettiest girls with the nicest voices and turns them into pop music, and all the pop music is essentially the same. Right? You know, it doesn't even matter what era it is, it's still, you know, a pretty girl with a microphone and that's your pop music. Completely generic, been that way for, you know, a really long time. Um, and then you take something like the Beatles, where they were completely generic, but they were generic and kind of deep. Mm -hmm. There was something deep and mysterious at the heart mm -hmm. of the Beatles. There was a bit of an, a kind of an alchemical spice to it. And I think as well, for them, at least, it's like they grew. You know, they didn't stay oh, yeah. the same. It was like yeah, from yeah. the beginning to then where they were at the end, it's like that was monumental oh. and transformative change rather than a pop star who the thing at the beginning of the career to the end of the career, it's kind of the same. As little know? change as possible. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The Beatles thing is a really good point. I mean, they dragged, you know, hundreds of millions of people with them yes, to that right. The <laughs> you know, <laughs> like the Mop Tops, hi, we're... <laughs> You know, we're from the upper end of the 1950s story. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. we're kind of the apex of the 1950s in 1963. Yeah. And, you know, by like, you know, the point where the Beatles break up, yeah. they're just like, you know, full scale mm. psychedelic war war. Yeah, John Lennon ah. Imagine, the whole deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. And everybody that latched onto the Beatles in phase one, you know, had to get, went through phase two, three, four, five, six, boom, seven, here we are. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if it was a static snapshot and you only had one thing to say, it's going to be really generic. Right, um, but it better be deep, not shallow, well, at least. Well, you can try the best you can. So the thing that... So this is a little bit of an aside, but I mm -hmm. think it helps. Um, the biggest realisation that I had over the course of my life, the thing which is fundamental to everything else, is I had to break down the illusion that we were civilised people that lived in a nice place. Because, mm. you know, as a, a child of the you know, 70s and 80s oh. in Britain, BBC reality was reality. <laughs> yes. And BBC reality is we are civilised people and we live in a nice place and history is kind of on our side, but it's quite difficult sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Stiff upper lip, right? Yeah. And, you know, it's taken me literally into my 40s to be able to completely dismantle that illusion, mm. right? We are not civilised people that live in a nice place. We are absolute bastards that live in hell. Right. Right? Interesting. And you see that when you look at statistical reality, right? You get away from the media story, you get away from the pictures, you get away from the things where people are paid to teach you, mm. right? And you just look, how many kids will starve for death this year? And it's a lot. What is the bare minimum right? metric? Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, maternal mortality, right? America's maternal mortality, the number of women that die in childbirth in America, is crazy. Crazy oh, bad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's crazy bad. We won't bad. even get down to reasons of being of like healthcare or insurance companies Ooh, right, and all that stuff. Right. But like the fact of the matter is, is that right. more women die in the United States than any other developed country in the world. And there's your bedrock, right? That is crazy. And then you say, civilized people that live in a nice place, yes, no. <laughs> right? Well, the numbers say not civilized people that live in a nice place. Right. Right? The numbers say bastards that live in hell. Right? Damn. 25% of the world's prisoners in 5% of the world's people. Yep. Right? I excuse me, but did the you say- the free, right? See what I'm saying, <laughs> right? So that sawing through the civilized people that live in a nice place mythology and accept that it's bastards that live in hell, if you model the human race as bastards that live in hell, we're actually doing pretty well. Right. Right? We're getting you know, better every year, or it seems to be in those kind of things. Down from the caves for 5,000 years, right. we've managed to nuke ourselves. We seem to be freaking out about the climate thing at an appropriate scale a bit late. Right. You know, the level of freaking out about climate that we're doing now, we probably should have done in about 95. Sure. <laughs> but a 20 year wag is not that bad as cultural things go. You Especially know? in terms of like the giant thing of Homo sapiens, even not just, you know, like right. the larger, larger scale. Yes. Um, and that, that world model shifting to, you know, human beings are bastards that live in hell, then you say, okay, well, you know, we're doing okay for that, right? Mm -hmm. There are actually some green shoots of hope, right? Compared to how bad it could be given how bad our history is, compared to how bad it is for the poorest and most unfortunate of us, mm -hmm. actually the parts of the system that work okay really work pretty well. 
under the circumstances. And what that helped me to do was differentiate between what was acceptable and unacceptable. Yes. Like, I stopped judging people for being imperfect. Right. Right? Actually, you know, for a bastard that lives in hell, he's a pretty good guy. <laughs> right? And then you could look at the people that were really exploiting the hell out of the situation and were kind of inherently evil versus the people that were doing the best they could and were basically just struggling in a world which was really not very good. Oh, that's a good way to reframe it. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it was, just, it was a bit like adjusting contrast on a camera, mm. right? You know, you adjust the aperture mm -hmm. and, you know, it was that everything was underexposed and everything was kind of like Gotham coloured. Yes, yes. Because if you think it's meant to be like you know, we are nice people and we live in a civilized place. If we're civilized people and we live in a nice place, we were failing that grade so comprehensively that the world looks terrible. Right. By, you know, civilized people that live in a nice place standards, wow, this is awful. Because it's not that, yeah. Right? Yeah. And then when I looked at it more from the, you know, okay, so we're bastards that live in hell, you know, it's actually we're kind of doing okay you know for for those kinds of people in that kind of a place we're actually getting our heads together in a fairly comprehensive way and we're beginning to change our conditions right and again i think this comes back to the colonial mythology right, right? the colonial mythology was kill people and take their stuff right that is not civilized people that live in a nice place behavior mm -hmm. but you know there was this like kind of Freudian covering over the hellishness of the colonial business model with this artificial pretend niceness, the kind of Victorian premise, oh, yes. mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. don't yeah. ask us what happens in the colonies where all the money is made, <laughs> over here we're all absolutely upright and genteel. Because <laughs> yes, right. we can put on a suit and a monocle or something and look the part that right. you were saying. And so they, they just kind of draw this veil over where the actual money is coming from. Absolutely. And you know, civilized people that live in a nice place was the upper class mythology. And then we all sort of bought into that when we got things like indoor plumbing. Oh yes. <laughs> right? Yes. And actually, the truth of the situation is that we are actually absolute bastards that live in hell. And we can improve the situation by being less ruthless mm -hmm. and by accepting that the world is kind of hellish and doing something about it. Mm -hmm. Right? And that, you know, if there was a single message, I hate to say it. But the single message is, you know, we are absolute bastards and we live in hell, and we have the moral and intellectual capability to improve in our conditions and our natures, and we have to, mm. because mm. otherwise we will remain stuck in this mess. Yes. Right. And it's not that we were civilized people that lived in a nice place and then we screwed it up and it became horrible. It's that we deluded ourselves into thinking that things were okay when they never had been, and that delusion has cost us fifty or a hundred years of progress. Right. Right. right? If we had actually stuck with the knitting, if we'd stayed close to the hard truth that we are not very nice and the world is really difficult, then we could have been so much more efficient at using technological progress to produce human welfare and solve human problems. Right. And indeed, all problems, not mm -hmm. just human anymore, because now we run the biosphere too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? You know, that thing where we replaced all of our animals with freaking cows. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like they're in the Amazon for the pastures oh, and stuff. Yeah. The horror, right? Yeah, yeah. And you, you kind of look at that and you can't square it with, you know, the civilized people that live in a nice place yeah. story. Yeah. Right? So we're clinging to civilized people that live in a nice place and it's making it almost impossible to us act on, for us to act on our real problems. Mm. Right? I think we really need this kind of collective awakening of like, actually, we are bad people that live in a bad world, and with effort we can improve. Because mm. right? that predicate is very important too, because you don't want to slide into <laughs> cynicism and pessimism, et cetera. This or at least maybe start from there, but then we have to have some way out. Or I mean, human beings don't want to be bad people that live in a bad place. Right. 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 They want to be good people that live in a good place, but the illusion that we already did drawn over by colonialism, drawn over by advertising, drawn over by politics, drawn over by culture, that's turned into total inability to act, right? right? And if we draw back that veil and actually look under the hood at how this place works, oh, this really is kind of a hell realm in a kind of Buddhist or a Hindu or a Shinto sense. Like, oh, this is the bad place. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you watch the TV show, The Good Place. Yes, yes, yes. Right? It's like, oh, right, we are actually in the bad place. How do you know? Well, have you seen who runs this joint and what we eat? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's ruled by demons and we eat the flesh of living beings. That is actually the Buddhist description of hell, isn't it? <laughs> yep, that, yep, that is actually the Buddhist description of hell. Okay, then, right, oh, well, fine. What are we to do then, right? Yeah. 
And you know, that notion that things are really horrible, right, and we can fix them, we had that world once upon a time, right? You know, medieval Christians, they were very sure that this world was ruled by devils and you had to work really hard to stay remotely morally clean. Totally. At some point, somewhere in the last few hundred years, and some you know, historical researcher has almost certainly written about this, but I don't know who, mm -hmm. right? At some point, we slip into thinking that the world is a nice place and everything ought to be okay. Right. And we lose that moral grinding edge of resistance to the inherent conditions that we're in. Right? We become really morally slack and kind of lazy. And what that results in is problems that we could solve that we then don't because we don't really want to admit there are problems. Right. Right? Now, if I asked you to sit down and make a list of 50 things that we could fix that we haven't because we're basically morally lazy and we're pretending the problem isn't there, you could make a list. Absolutely. I could make a list. You could make a list. Or your listeners could make a list. Half of the things on that list would be the same things for basically everybody. Right. 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 Yes. So it's not that we don't know individually that this whole thing is a farce. What we don't have is we don't have collective knowledge the whole thing is a farce. Yes. Yes. And when you get the breakthroughs into collective knowledge, this is Greta Thunberg standing up at the UN and saying like, look, you have failed me personally and my entire generation. Our lives will be ruined because you sat on your hands, we are watching you and this is not good enough. And everybody nods, oh yeah, that thing. Right? Mm -hmm. And this is true, the Epstein scandal. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Everybody knows that rich men spend an enormous amount of time with call girls in shady circumstances. Right? Well known, you know, like half of the prostitutes in America wind up uh, you know, surrounding whatever town it is that they have Bohemian Grove in. Oh, right. right? Like Central California. Or Central California, yeah, yeah, yeah. wherever Bohemian yeah, Grove yeah, is, like when Bohemian Grove is on, half the... Half John the, Ronson yeah, right? was there with Alex Jones. Yeah, I remember right? that. Yes, yes, yes. Half <laughs> the high-end prostitutes in America go to Bohemian Grove, but you know, trust me, all of these are fine, upstanding moral That's men. That's so funny. I'd never even... Yeah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah. You know, the Vatican, right? Everybody oh, sure. knows they've got child abuse data piled high. They oh, know yeah. exactly what's Moving going on. Moving priests from places to places. Right. Even the last pope was not is not the pope because of that whole thing. Right. Yes. You know Ratzinger. Right? Hey. Oh yeah. <laughs> mm, uh, yes. Uh, the pope, uh, pope Palpatine was that the name? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Certain similarities. So in the That's countries good. where they've had the the realization, like Ireland, mm -hmm. right? The child abuse scandal in Ireland went off like a nuclear bomb. Right. Right. The Irish now have to import priests from Nigeria mm. because not enough Irish people want to be priests. Mm. Because it's seen as being like, oh, so I didn't know you were a kiddie fiddle and you went into the priesthood, did you? Right? right. It's a total breaking of the power of the church in Ireland. Mm -hmm. right? And they skinned Sinead O'Connor alive for pointing that out in the 1990s. Turns out she was right. Mm -hmm. right? So it's not that we are in a position where these things are you know, unfixable. It's not that you can't know from individual knowing to collective and, and collective knowing, right? So that would be the message, mm. right? Well, here's to our collective awakening, Vinay. Mm. Well, so thank you for coming on Eclectic Space Walk Conversations. I really appreciate it. Um, and then uh, until I'll have all the show notes from Vinay and, and everything, but uh, thank you so much again. And until next time, Ad Astra. <laughs>